Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Strange Playgrounds yet again. And once again, a guest who should be well familiar to all of you by now. You've been on quite a lot, haven't you, Lex? I have. I've done a few of these now. We've done yeah. quite a few now, haven't we? Since um, since the color out of space, we've done yes. quite a few. We've done all right. Um, but this is this is an interesting one. I mean, we've sort of, I, I sort of started the ball rolling. I, I covered the BBC, the, the recent BBC adaptation of Dracula briefly. My own thoughts on the first episode, um, and now we're going to have a more a broader look at Dracula itself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Pff, this this is. This is a really difficult one to cover. I sort of, I was sort of thinking about it earlier today. How do you even begin with something this huge? It, yeah, because it covers so much in pop culture. There's obviously the yeah. films. There's the, so many different books, yeah. as well as the original one. Comics. You've got the actual the comics. You've got the original mythology of the character. Right. You've you've got video games mm -hmm. like Castlevania, most yeah. famously. Of and, course, and of course, Castlevania. I forgot about. I forgot about. Oh yeah. That. Oh yeah, and Gosh. then you've got all the, the toys and cartoons and, yeah. and you know even like modern day things like Hotel Transylvania. Yeah, parodies uh, of course, you know, yeah. like cartoon and, and and horror parodies out there. It's it's one I mean, it's it's what you were talking about earlier. This this story, I mean, it's so huge that it's become metatextual at this point. It is not just like a it's not just a book, it's not just a movie. There are people out there. There are people listening to this who have likely never really seen any of the films never read any of the books but yeah. will know this story well the other thing is i find that is a lot the the, the story of dracula mm. is a lot like kind of what we said about the christmas carol in yeah. that people think of certain things when they think of that story which might not be from the original book that's absolutely because there's, true there's so many adaptations which have added bits yeah. and then later adaptations have said oh i liked that in an older adaptation so i'll do that as well and then it, it that becomes part of the law it even does it, yeah it's, not it's sort of it snowballs doesn't it, it yes. i mean arguably the reason that the dracula story has survived beyond any sort of wider um oral tradition and mythological resonances that it has which it clearly does um is because of cinema it's because yeah. of cinema i mean one of the obviously one of the earliest films that most people will think of in the history of cinema is nosferatu yes very much yeah. and nosferatu yeah. was originally conceived as an adaptation of dracula um the reason it's not called dracula and the reason the vampire in that is, is called count orlock is because they couldn't get the rights to it you were just saying about Nosferatu being the uh, the first the first sort of one of the first film version films of anything really. Yeah, well that's the thing. I mean, Nosferatu. It's I mean, when most people think of the early days of cinema, the most people will think of that film. They will think of Nosferatu because it's so iconic. Um, but that really is the reason why Dracula has survived. I mean, it was popular during its day. It was relatively popular. But it didn't go anywhere near the fame of something like, say, oh, Frankenstein, for example, or uh, H.G. Wells' work. No, I think that it wasn't there a play first and then it was the play that they then adapted into a film which was what Nosferatu was I believe it probably was yeah but like even the original book wasn't massively popular no it was infamous. no it, it, not it, in the way that it is now no it, 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 it was infamous more than anything I mean what what happened when the book dropped is that Vic, sort of polite Victorian society railed against it um, largely because of its imagery, you know, I mean, you have to look at what Victoriana was all about. You had the sort of the upper surface level, which was all about protocol and etiquette and manners and controlling oneself and being very British oh, and all of that bullshit. And then underneath yeah. you had the, you had basically what revealed the hypocrisies of that society. So you had the seething prostitution, you had drug addiction, you had opium dens, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing going on. Um, and suddenly dropped into the the literate world, which would of course would have been the upper class world of Victoriana. You have this novel that contains. I mean, the, the the novel itself isn't that racy. It isn't that sort of graphic at all, really. But you do have this story about this foreign gentleman creeping into young ladies' bedrooms and biting their yes. necks. You know. Yes. Um, so there was kind of a moral furor against Dracula when it came out. 
And that's kind of ironic when you look at the text itself, because the book is, in terms of its implications and its themes, massively conservative. Yes, it is. Yeah, very, very much so. It's it's not it's not even particularly racy or anything, well, is it? It's it's very sort of subdued and yeah. and you know. Well, you never actually see anything happen. The book very it doesn't describe any of the the instances of Dracula actually biting someone or whatever or seducing someone. Everything's told no. in retrospect. It's all told in retrospect. Um, it's all journalistic, which was the style at the time. So it's it's like this when you read the book. It's this odd collection of journal pages, newspaper articles, and that kind of thing. Like you know um, the whole uh, trip across the sea when Dracula is um, yeah. is in the uh, uh, in the boat and travels to Whitby. Um, that is told via the medium of a newspaper clipping. Yes, it is. That's right. Yeah, because yeah. then there's the black dog sighting, isn't there? That's which right. when the boat crashes. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And then it becomes like this series of interrelated newspaper articles that tells you, kind of implies what's happening. Uh, yes. And of course, if you didn't know, if you didn't know that this supernatural creature was on board the ship, then you wouldn't even realize that that's what it's implying. Um, but you never get to see any of the salacious details. You never get to see, there's no descriptions of Dracula biting the neck of Lucy Westenra, for example, or anything like that. No, and all the sort of sexualized stuff that we now think of with regards to Dracula, that's not really... Nope. It's not that's there. not there, is it? Not, it's not at all. And I, I mean, I think Bram Stoker, because he was a he was an interesting man. He was actually rather horrible. He was very, very conservative, massively racist. Um, even by the standards of the time, he was considered a little bit racist. You know? Right. Um, yeah. Right. And I mean, when you read Dracula, that's all there. Obviously, it's all there. I mean, ultimately, it is a book about the the unpleasant, strange foreign man who comes into our lay into our women's bedchambers and seduces them and makes them like him you know um, oh yeah that's basically the subtext of the story and um i mean stoker himself when you look at his wider writings it, you know the, the more journalistic stuff and the correspondence that he wrote he's fairly he's fairly overt about that he's a, he was a massive anti uh, anti-progressive basically Yes, well, that's very, very sort of there within it because Dracula, in a way, it, it, ironically, he, he's sort of become like a figure of almost of like Victorian sexual liberation, isn't right, he? Right? Isn't that the irony? Yeah, isn't, isn't it really that just is. The yeah, massive irony that down the years, the notion of the vampire, what Bram Stoker wrote. I mean, in the book, Dracula is just a monster. Yes, there, pretty much, yeah. There's none of this ambiguity about him being a tortured soul or about being like... that. But for example, the love story that has been sort of accrued down the ages, which is emphasised in uh, Francis Ford Coppola's film adaptation, obviously. Yes. That's not there. There is none of that. He's just a monster. Yeah, yeah, it's... it's... I think it's ironic, really, that people of of that is now immediately what you think of when yeah, you think right? of him is the, the tortured soul that, yep. like every every vampire trope um, that sort of comes from that kind of melancholy, you know, sexy immortal, yeah, whether it's yeah. whether it's Angel or, or Edward Cullen or any yeah. of that, that all comes from Dracula. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, all of that. Yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. I mean, but it, it doesn't come from the book version. No, it doesn't. <laughs> It absolutely doesn't. In the book, he is supposed to be the like an incarnation of evil. Yes, he is. Yeah, it's That's... almost as if he he has a body because he has to have a body. But like, he has an effect on the environment merely yeah. by his presence there. Yeah, right. Like, I think it mentions with the Demeter that the seas were calm until that ship set yeah. off, and then you know, it's almost like nature itself is rebelling against him being there. And... That's it. That's it. Because he is obviously unnatural. He is a, a dead thing walking. He is preternatural evil and that's and that's exactly what he's portrayed as in the book you know he's a total monster there isn't even any of the the stuff that would come in later where he partially seduces the women that he bites yes that's it's almost like there. a willingness isn't it yeah. that they kind of want him to but there's, yeah. there's none of that no no, no there is none of it. in fact the female characters in the i i, I hesitate to use the term characters because they're not even really characters the characters in no the, they're kind of archetypes of of 
very male prescribed virginity and pureness and and whatnot and that that kind that's all they are yeah <laughs> they're there to tell a story aren't they you yeah. need the helpless maiden and, and there he is even Mina Murray, you know, I mean, in, in yeah. the, the later adaptations, very often Mina Murray is, um, she kind of comes to almost collude with Dracula. You know, she becomes his concubine or his bride-to-be or whatever. That's not really there either. <laughs> it's, no, it's not. but I think I, I, I do quite like this sort of thing, though, when a character's been around for that long, that there's a whole mythology that's been added to it. Oh, don't get me wrong. I think it's great. I, I actually like most of the adaptations better than the original book. Yes, yes. I really do. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I came to the original book... So, not late on as such i was actually quite young when i read it but i'd certainly seen a lot of adaptations and films and parodies and god knows what beforehand yeah that's an interesting point i can't remember which version i saw first with films i cannot remember for that i honestly can all the tropes that i think of when i think of my discovery of of dracula are all the sort of thing that kind of started with the original Bela Lugosi version yeah, yeah. but they're kind of there in all of them so I'm not sure I remember being introduced to the character in general and that was by my great grandmother and um, my 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 dad's grandma uh-huh. when I was about four or five because so very young I, yeah very yeah because i've always you know like when you're a kid you're into different things depending what's thrown at you so you're into transformers for a while then you're into for our generation then you're into he-man for a while then it's thundercats then it's turtles whereas there's some things that no matter what you're always into that it might be football it might be video games whatever for me it was always like traditional horror stuff right right ghosts and graveyards and foggy moors and bogs and so castles gothic, and all. yeah, the yeah. Gothic tradition i remember buying um you used to get these these uh halloween uh, you could get you probably still can you could get these like some sort of chocolate logs and the box was like a little graveyard and i used right. to get i used to make me mom get the empty boxes from the co-op <laughs> so that I could put toys and stuff in them just really? all that kind of thing i'm really into all that and i used yeah. to ask my mom to take me to graveyards and just anything like that i was just fascinated by that so the tropes so, of the gothic and i mean, I mean <laughs> dracula isn't like it's nowhere near the first gothic tr- no it's novel, not but it is probably the one that most people think of exactly yeah and and so my, my my grandma knew i was into all of this stuff my great grandma and she i remember her saying to me once um have you heard of dracula it was a christmas eve right? she was sat in the armchair and i was sat on the floor and i remember very vividly remember her saying to me have you heard of dracula and when she first said that i thought it was going to be some sort of a dragon because the name sounds well, like a that's dragon what it means actually yes I mean, it that does, is doesn't actually it? what yes. it means like the of the order of the dragon Yes. Um, and then and also because, I mean, I I know that I have a Yorkshire accent, but I don't think mine is that strong compared no. to some people's. But my grandmother had a very strong accent. So I, I have a very vivid memory of the way she pronounced Dracula. And it was almost as if it was spelt with a like you are at the end as opposed <laughs> to an A and a, and a K, just like a very, very heavily Yorkshire way of saying it. Yeah. You know? Well, it's a hard um, word to say anyway, isn't it, Dracula? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Yeah, so, and I remember her then telling me about him in as much of a sanitised way as, yeah. as she, you know, she could. Um, and then I, I, I then, it's one of those things, once you know about it, you start yeah. spotting it everywhere. So then I started spotting versions of it in cartoons of course, and, and, of course. you know, and, and everything else. And, and But that, yeah, and then I had toys of it, which I, I've still got. Uh-huh. I've got this little, like, miniature Dracula toy, which I think came from Burger King or something like that. <laughs> I've, I've still got that on one of my shelves. Well, this is um, the thing, isn't it? I mean, the the character is so ubiquitous. He is so pervasive in culture that you you actually get, like, parodies of him and of the story in children's cartoons in comics yeah. toys just all over the place all over the place and when you don't have parodies you have references to the material like like morbius you know morbius the living vampire from spider-man yes he was the first vampire character in comic books for about 30 years you know was he I did because not know that. no not as long as that sorry um about 20 years because um 
horror comics from the 50s are a big thing that i'm into i've got oh, collections of them all comics, yes kind of yes way, yeah. and and they were they were banned during the mccarthy era of wow, america because they were seen yeah they were seen as being troublesome usually because there was a lot of like there was a vein of anti-authority with them so the the big rich capitalist bank manager would do something corrupt and wow. his whole business partner would come back from the dead and get him but right. that implies that there's something negative about being a big rich businessman or anything yes. that's you know so so it's seen as almost was... redolent of, of reds under the bed yeah they're trying yes, to corrupt exactly. American youth you know yes yes um so and also because mccarthy he was also responsible for slipping the reference to god into the american pledge of allegiance so anything that went against christianity such as demons and zombies or anything like that well, he didn't like that isn't so... that somewhat ironic because like given given that i mean most of the horror stories that were adapted for ec comics and certainly the the vampire and dracula stories were heavily pro-christian and pro-morality yes. in the sense that the vampire the demon whatever was always the bad guy and they were always undone by some sort of like prayer or you know splashing oh, absolutely. Holy water or you, you know the the shape of the crucifix so in the end of these stories faith wins out ultimately <laughs> And there's always a morality there. The person that gets something bad happened to him is always someone who deserves it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in, that, in those comics. <laughs> that's the, I mean, again, this is the irony, isn't it? You get that reaction to the comics and to the stories in the McCarthy era, which echoes the same reaction that the book got in Victoriana, despite the fact that the book is actually really conservative when you actually start yes. to read it, you know? Well, I, I doubt very much that McCarthy had looked at these comics very much, to oh, be honest. I, but... I doubt he even ever looked at one. I, but, I, I, I doubt one ever crossed his hands, you know? No, but the, so what had happened is that they made this band then that comic books couldn't feature, and it was things like violence yes, and blood. And, and, or something like that, yeah? Yes, it's also what made Batman turn into this campy sort of character that he was, um, instead of the original sort of brutal vigilant that he'd yeah. been to start with. Um, and, and basically vampires were on this list of things you couldn't feature right, at all. You couldn't have them biting people's necks, presumably. Yeah. Or there was, there was like nothing that. you could you could nothing you could have them do. So. I guarantee you as well. I guarantee you that wrapped up in that was a certain strain of uh, homophobia. You couldn't have like intimate male contact, like a male vampire biting a male on the neck. Yeah, I reckon you know, that's probably I'll definitely bet, there. I bet you any money that was part of it too. Well, Marvel. The, the, the law changed for comic books in the 70s mm -hmm. where you could now okay you can feature that stuff but you've got to have this logo on front saying Which basically like film basically. releases you know it's a 12 it's a pg yeah. it's a whatever so marvel took advantage of that and introduced the first comic book vampire character for about 20 years which was morbius for right, the right. i mean of course now whenever morbius features in the comics they don't give a shit you know he just he he, yeah. he bites willy-nilly and there's there's blood flying everywhere you know i'm also pretty sure he's gay in at least one adaptation is of him. He? In what I'm sure that. he is, or by at least because ah. I know he's had a boyfriend in one of them because it was a scientist he was working with. I did not know that. That is interesting. I mean, did you see the way um, the 1990s cartoon got around the fact that they couldn't have in a children's cartoon this character with the hand? Yeah, yeah. he sucked like a leech, wasn't it? Which ironically yeah. is way more fucking disturbing yes, than having him just bite someone's <laughs> neck. You know, he has these, got these suckers like yeah. octopus suckers in his hand that he clamps to people's wrist and, and to their neck. And it's actually much more disturbing. Than yes, just it is. It's like a lamp reel in your hand, isn't it? Right? And it's, yeah. <laughs> it's so silly. It's so silly. I love that. So they took something that they thought that kids would find disturbing and then replaced it with something that's way more disturbing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, but yeah, Mobius was the first one that they did. But then with the success of that, they then did the actual dracula comic books so marvel yes, had its own run of dracula comic books as well Why isn't dracula an actual character in the marvel universe <laughs> I don't know if he's kind of an adjunct to it. I don't think you're likely to see him fighting Spider-Man or anything, yeah. but he's sort of there in the same universe, technically speaking. Right, right, 
Right. Because, I mean, this is another thing. Because the Dracula character, again, is so iconic that he turns up in various universes as well. So you yes. have, like, you know, Dracula versus Billy the Kid and that kind of thing. <laughs> you know? Well, technically, Conan exists in the Marvel Universe as well. Right, Conan the Barbarian. Right, okay. Because they did comic books. But the way they... Something they've done with that, the only way they've linked that into the main Marvel Universe that I'm familiar with... Uh-huh is that there is uh, one of Conan's enemies is this elder god called Set, who is this yes, giant. Yeah. yeah. And at one point, yeah, that's it. And and he has this, this thing called the serpent crown, which is like a crown made out of snakes that his followers wear, and through that he can control them. It's like Sauron's ring, right, basically. Right, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the and, magic MacGuffin. It's the big, big yeah. magic MacGuffin. Yeah. And, that turns up in a modern day Marvel story at one point, and Hydra get hold of it. Oh, of all the people, it would be bloody Hydra. So, well, of course it? it would. So that is kind of a link between the old Sumerian era Conan comics yeah. and the modern Marvel universe, <laughs> which is quite a cool one. I That's quite like quite that. Fun, isn't it? that. But I'm not aware fun. of anything like that with Dracula. They might be. I'm not. I'm not yeah. a massive Marvel reader, so there may well be some I'm story sure there. But at some point, there must have been like. Dracula must have turned up in some of the Marvel comics. He must. But if if you're gonna do it, I like that Conan way of doing it. Like, there's a nice link there, yeah. suggesting that thousands of years ago, if you go into the Marvel universe and travel back in time using Doctor Doom's platform thing, if yeah. you go back far enough, you'll see Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. But you're not going to see him studying working with Iron Man. I like that version of it. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, maybe what? I mean, yeah. there are even if he's not in it, there are so many interesting ways of weaving the mythology into it, aren't there? So he could be like a mutant. Yeah, he, he could. Uh, or, or they could even... I mean, vampires exist in Marvel because they you've do. got Blade and all of that. And so. Morbius and all the other... You know. Yeah. Although Morbius, I, I believe Morbius is a slightly different type of vampire because he was made by science, wasn't he? He was made by an accident. He was, but there's been that many retcons. I'm not sure what his actual origin is anymore. Right, right. Because know... originally it was something he took out of vampire bats. That's that right, because he had yeah. a disease, didn't he? He had some sort of yes. blood-related disease, I believe, that he was trying to to fight, and that, and he used um, he used some sort of like plasma from vampire bats. That's to right. To cure and well, course... in, in at least one of the more modern versions, it turns out the vampire bat that he used was actually a vampire who changed form. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay so he might be like he might be this weird collision of all yeah. the vampire lore he's, he's at once a science fiction vampire and a mythological vampire as well yeah okay. uh, i'm not quite sure what currently stands because it, it, it's one of those characters that's had so many revamps and yeah. should be, re, well, you know retrofits you can't quite to be fair yeah you know. oh like all the marvel characters you know? Yeah, most of them have at some point, even if it's just like some characters' origins stay pretty much the same, but they just have to move forward when it happened. Yes, so, like, yeah. originally Iron Man got, it got, it became Iron Man in Vietnam, whereas that would now make Tony Stark about 70. Right. So, that, <laughs> so but, can't, but, can't be. You know? <laughs> So now it's Afghanistan, but right. you know, but but generally speaking, they kind of stay the same. But I think a bit like Ghost Rider, I think Morbius is one of those whose origins has been all over the place. Yeah, so I, yeah. I don't know what, or indeed, I don't know what version the film's going to go for. The, the trailer seems to suggest it's the classic vampire bats thing. I, I think that might be the one they go for because it is it is such an easy thing to do as well in cinematic yeah. form, isn't it? It's certainly the one the car- the cartoons go for generally the, most of the cartoon adaptations if they feature morbius it's it's the science one i was trying to think just then actually what what i remember of the marvel comics version of dracula because i know i've read them but i can't remember much about them at all to oh, be honest I've, I've, i don't think i ever encountered them i think i you know i know of them but i've never actually encountered them myself i think my I can't remember at all what my first exposure to the character was, but I do know that I had difficulty pronouncing his name when I was a kid. It must have been early on, because I was really young. I was really young when I knew the name. And I I used to say it Draclia. Right, okay, yeah. That's what I remember, and it took me a long time to learn how to say Dracula. (laughs) <laughs> um, well, I do remember I do vaguely remember being really really young and watching a BBC adaptation of the story 
that was quite oh, really? scary. Yeah, quite okay. scary. I can't remember who it was who played him. Um, I can remember, I, all I can remember about it was the phony baloney sort of special effects when he turned into the, the mist and slipped <laughs> into, into Lucy's bedchamber. And it was, it was terrible. It was, I've, I've gone back and looked at it since because I found it really scary as a kid. But, looking at it out it was absolutely bloody atrocious you know um but even think, for its time or do you think it was all right at the I, time i think even for its time it was pretty bad it was pretty <laughs> bad uh but i think that may have been one of my first exposures to the straight character but in terms of in terms of like the adaptations the one of my earliest must be ducula yeah that's a good point it's do you remember be- um uh, little dracula as well yeah, that was a cartoon. oh my god actually now that you mention that the little dracula books that the cartoon is based on might have been one of the first exposures i had because his, his dad is dracula obviously you know? <laughs> yes he was wasn't it and i remember wasn't there a villain whose head was garlic Oh, I cannot for the life of me remember. <laughs> I'm sure there was like a, a, his head was a giant clover garlic or something. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure right. there was. All I remember about the books in particular is that they were really elaborate. Like the images had all of these details all over them, and they were really kind of gross in the way that little boys love. Yes. So there were like silly severed hands and eyeballs and things. <laughs> you know? um, and they were great fun. They were great fun. That may have been it. That might have been my first exposure to the material. I mean, th- th- again, this is the point, isn't it? The fact that there are people who, you know, and this was quite a while ago. This was in the 1980s, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. made children, like really young children's picture books based on the character now. What do you think Bram Stoker would have made of that? <laughs> yeah that's interesting i mean in some ways that as you said at the start is kind of responsible for keeping his character alive but But would he rather have not had that it's It's, it's um, interesting it's like what we were talking about with lovecraft you know what would lovecraft make of the fact that there are now cthulhu plushes yes yeah yeah he would be spinning so hard in his gravy drill right through to the core of the earth wouldn't he yeah, I don't think he'd like it at I all. But, but then again, both Lovecraft and Bram Stoker were such unpleasant people. I'm kind of happy that they wouldn't like it. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's, it's... That, I mean, but why do you think it is? Why do you think it is that down down the eons, the down the years and the decades, the, this creature that was created to be a figure of horror, just the, the most loathsome anti-human thing, has become a source of romanticism and aspiration almost, to the point whereby there are now people who who, who proclaim to be vampires. <laughs> I, I'm not sure where that came from. I think it would almost be a case of, like, pinpointing where that started. Something must have given a spark to that. Did did people consider Bela Lugosi quite handsome? Or, oh, I or... imagine the films have got a lot to do with it. Yeah, definitely. Because, because... the films lend him something that he doesn't have in the book. In the book, he is not this sort of elegant, you know, no. beautiful thing. In fact, but bear described... in mind that that has happened with the Joker when they cast Heath Ledger. Yes, of course. This is a character who is meant to be a disgusting, despicable human being, yeah. but then they cast someone who's a bit of a Hollywood hunk, mm-hmm. and suddenly you've got loads of fangirls creaming over him. Right, right. It's interesting, isn't uh, it? it? So it's got to be similar for Dracula. There has I got to have been that. some point where some actor who was a bit sexy for the time was cast as him, and now suddenly people have got these fantasies about it him. It may have been Christopher Lee, you know. It may have been Christopher yeah, Lee. Yeah, he was good-looking in his youth, wasn't he, he? He really was. I mean, he was a very statue human being yeah. and as dracula he has a certain presence about him you know this real magnetic quality uh, he's very elegant very well turned out and he speaks beautifully so i can see why someone would look at him in his regalia and think mm, yes he's he's rather attractive but it's also the fact that now the the vampire has come to occupy a state of such romanticism that it's aspired to you know there there is this desire it seems in humanity to transcend itself the romanticism of becoming a monster 
Well, interestingly, if you go back far enough with the vampire myth, mm. there's no difference between a vampire and a zombie. Right, right. In like yes. the original, really old like Egyptian versions of it, mm. it's just one creature called a revenant, mm. which is basically a dead person who, for whatever reason, is not a quiet dead person. So yes, maybe yeah. they were maybe they were buried improperly, maybe mm. they were uh, hung or unjustly, or for whatever reason they are not happy at rest, right, so they right. come back. And it's a, they return from the dead and feast on the flesh of the living. This distinction between a shambling rotten corpse yes. and an elegant humanoid vampire who just drinks your blood, yeah. that didn't come until much later in, no, in, in terms fact, of mythology. That may have actually been Dracula that did that. Because um, there, there are vampire myths all over the world as well. I mean, if you look at almost any culture, there is a form of vampire like the Lamia from ancient Greece. Yeah. Um, they're, they're all over the place. There's a... Uh, there's a Japanese vampire that hops for some reason. It hops <laughs> on their leg. There, there are versions of the. I mean, obviously, they're not called the vampire, but there are vampiric blood drinking entities in almost every mythology you can think of. Um, the Dracula one, the one that Bram Stoker used, is really interesting because it's it's this odd mishmash of things. Obviously, you have Vlad yes. the Pesh, you know, you have Vlad the Impaler is part of it because he literally is vlad the impaler he actually is that that person uh but you also have uh, you know you you must have heard of elizabeth bathory yes of course yeah. wasn't she related to vlad tepes in some way that uh, wouldn't surprise me i mean she was I'm sure they were like was, a distant cousin or something like that well she was a nobility from that era that area of the world so it wouldn't surprise me in the least but she is also regarded as the very first documented serial killer all right, okay. Because she murdered, by all accounts, and also one of the most prolific as well. I mean, she was aristocracy, so she was above reproach. No, yes. but nobody would have targeted her, and she only she only killed um, lower class people. She only killed her slaves, so nobody, nobody gave a shit. You know what got her in the end? No, she murdered one of her handmaids because she used to. She always used to murder, by all accounts, the youngest, most beautiful people, and then she okay. used to bathe in their blood because she thought that it made her young. She thought that it kept her young. She murdered this girl who was in her employ, who happened to turn out to be, I think, she was the daughter or the niece of some Hungarian nobleman in disguise. Ah, and okay. The entire household of this Hungarian nobleman swept upon her, bricked her up in her tower, and left her to die. <laughs> so she, first time she killed someone that actually people right. gave a crap about. Yeah, exactly. Was... <laughs> but do you know what? Do you know what her body count is? No. Go the on. estimates are rough, obviously, because there's no records from that era. But it's assumed that she killed over six hundred people. <laughs> Is it true that she actually bathed in the blood thinking it would make her younger? Is that actually a thing? That's, or is that's, that just sort of... It's hard to say. That's certainly what's attached to her. Yeah. That's certainly what, what like the myth has come to be down the down the eons. No, it's hard to really say, obviously, because it's so it's so long ago and it's from such an odd area of the world of which there are very few records and whatnot. True. Um, so it's hard to say what's mythology because of course after she was bricked up they would have gone on a campaign of smearing her completely so it wasn't uncommon to say of add, add stuff to it yeah, yeah like if you had someone who was a who was just like a bog standard killer a murderer it was not uncommon to say that they were possessed by a demon or that they were, yes they were a werewolf or something to that effect so saying that she bathed in their blood and she flayed their skins and hung them from the battlements of her tower and she drank their blood and all of this stuff probably wasn't true yeah it, it seems like something that get added on later yes, doesn't it it certainly does but the mythology is accrued and accrued and accrued and it's definitely the case that bram stoker knew about it because he wrote about it so well the, what i like about that approach though is, is something i've done with with one of my own books mm -hmm. um it, it is for ghosts which I, I what i've done with my my one of my books that's coming out later this year is uh -huh. i basically research different ghosts mythologies from yeah. various cultures and basically I, I did it with post-it notes on my wall right. and i had like different powers that ghosts are supposed to have uh -huh. different weaknesses that they're supposed to have yeah. and different restrictions and i basically just 
like sort of yeah I'll have that one that that yeah. that that and just so made like said, a hodgepodge of yeah. the stuff that I like you're pick and, and mixing the ghosts yeah yes <laughs> and that is what Bram Stoker did with vampire mythology absolutely. as well absolutely it's so true it's so true and like just history in general you know he took Vlad Tepes because he was particularly violent and unpleasant yeah man. Um, he mixed it in a little bit of Elizabeth Bathory mythology with it a little bit of Strigoi uh, you know mixed in there a little bit of vampire myth from Romania and Moldavia all yeah. sort of hodgepodge together and then he mingled in a little bit of sort of biblical and uh, Christianic mythology and suddenly you get this character you get this this creature that's at the same time traditional and new well the, the thing the, the thing that falls apart with the Christianity Christ, Christianity Christianity bits mm. is that what about vampires that were around before the cross right Right. Have they suddenly developed a weakness to this piece of wood nailed yeah. together, or oh. are they immune to it? Or... I mean, this, this is this is a problem I have with Dracula and vampires in general. It's certainly like you know when you get to the Christopher Lee Hammer adaptations, right? Yeah. The, Even now... putting two sticks together is right, enough. Right. So, <laughs> and this is the thing: they are idiots. Yeah. In the films, for the most part, vampires are frigging idiots because they live in these castles that have massive windows with drapes that can just <laughs> handily be pulled apart as the as the dawn sun is coming up or they have yeah. candlesticks on the tables that can just handily be put together to form the emulation of a crucifix you know it's like you frigging idiots in fact in one in the first like hammer horror dracula that's how that's how van helsing defeats or rather i think it's jonathan harker defeats Dracula by picking up two candlesticks and making them into the sign of the cross. But why like, does that even work? Just yeah. holding two sticks together. Even if you, if even if we accept that the image of the cross, right, right, you know, just holding two sticks together. That was not something that was formed in faith, believing that this is an yeah. icon of faith, that this is representative right. of Jesus Christ. It's, it's just, just a, two sticks. Yeah, yeah, right. so why does that work? Right, right. It's just one of those things that you don't question. It's it? stupid. It's, it's absolutely stupid. stupid. It's like, it's okay. like the the invited being invited in thing. Right, right. Right. Why? So if if you come around my house and then a vampire turns up, can you invite them in? Because it's not your house. There are corollaries, but... aren't there? There are complexities <laughs> that are problematic, right? Yeah. And what, what about you squatting? If... What if you're what if in a hotel? What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is that your room or is that the hotel's room? I mean, what, if, what if it's a mixed-use building where the bottom half is retail and the top half is an hotel? Can they come into that? Can they? Do... It, it just falls <laughs> apart as soon as you start asking the right, question. What if it's shared ownership? What if two people own the house or the dwelling and one of them says... Like a, you can like a condo. Like, yeah? <laughs> like a flat share sort of thing, uh, yeah. It's, that, I mean, it is. I mean, have you ever read the uh, Terry Pratchett Discworld book, Carp Jugulum? I haven't, no. Right, in Carp Jugulum, right, Terry Pratchett discusses, he, he explores this very notion, right? Because there are there are vampires on the Discworld, obviously. And the, the way he describes it is that vampires, the reason all these rules pertain to vampires are they can't look at holy symbols, are they can't cross running water, oh, they can't, they can't stand garlic, oh, they can't, they can't enter a home if they're, unless they're invited, is because they are incredibly superstitious. It's psychosomatic. It's they, so um, they think it, um, it's true, they yeah. They think it's true, so it becomes true, basically. But because That's interesting, they, yeah. Because they are creatures of the abstract themselves, because they believe it, it manifests physically. Of so course, they actually yeah. do combust into dust if they're in sunlight. But vampires can, in the disc world, they can disabuse themselves of that notion. Yeah, so if they no longer believe it, it won't hurt. Exactly, exactly. There is a, um, in Carp Jugulum, the whole thing that's happening is there's like a new, there's a new overlord of the vampires, a new like high count of the vampires who is trying to teach them rationality. Right, because okay. They're yeah. all such a superstitious bunch that, that, that he's trying to teach them, for God's sake, it's not, it's just two sticks held together. It's not yeah. going to hurt you. You know, it's it, it's a bulb of garlic. It's a, it's a freaking vegetable. It's not going to hurt you. You know, it's yeah. so funny. It's, it's actually, I mean, it's played for laughs, obviously, because it's, it's, it's a good point, though. It is. It's great. It's really funny. Some of the, I mean, you know, there have been, there have 
have been vampire laws down the down the decades that have tried to explain these things. Why? Well, I like when there's a creative way around it. Like you know, obviously I'm a you're a fan of Buffy. Yeah, um, of course. You, you know the character of Spike. Yep. Um, the, the, one of the uh, novelizations from the series, um, which was all about Spike. There was one scene which I always thought would have made a good bit on television um where he's trying to get at somebody who hides in the house right and they're like oh you can't come in now because i want to invite you and he's like that's fine i'll just set fire to your house <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, but it's like, yeah, yeah why not why wouldn't you do that why you, you stay in there then he's fine <laughs> what a, yeah <laughs> yeah it's not the ultimate defense you think it is is it? no it's not if your vampire is not an idiot it isn't so I'll, I'll just set fire to your house and you're gonna have to come out at some point aren't you i love it i love it to bits i mean in dracula it's gotten around as well because all he does in in the original book is he just hypnotizes the women yeah, the but why does that work even within the context of the rules that's not your free will then yeah, exactly, you're supposed yeah. to be saying of my free will i invite you into my abode right. therefore removing the protection if you're being it hypnotized by him that doesn't work right right so it, it's even more bullshit isn't it ultimately yeah. it's complete so, bullshit complete it, there's no logic to it i right. think vampires make much more sense when they do them almost like it's a biological disease with yes, some benefits right. Right. I mean, there are some of the mythological vampires that do that do have some um, rationale, certainly for things like the holy symbols. Like, uh, if you look at Vampire the Masquerade, you know, the tabletop yeah. RPG, in that, vampires are all descended from Cain. Ah, well, there's a similar version. Did you watch the Wes Craven's Dracula film? Uh, 2000 Dracula 2000 I, 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 I have seen it but it was a long time ago because in that Dracula is Judas Iscariot right right yeah that that, that kind so the of the silver hurts him because of right, the 30 pieces of, the of silver th- yeah the sunlight I... hurts him because he's like when he hung himself it was as the sun was rising right. the cross because he can't bear the shame of it of and all of that and no, so but... but but also the problem with that is that you have to accept that dracula is the first vampire then right. which doesn't really make sense when you consider that the myth's been around since egyptian times right, right. that yeah that's problematic isn't it as well yeah kane makes more sense because kane is like he does because it's know. way further back yes yeah, yeah. Um... But yeah, I mean, what, what's your favourite adaptation, by the way? Which one do you like the best in terms of the film? I really, really like the one from a few years ago. For the first, it's a two-hour film. For the first hour and forty-five minutes, I love it, yeah. and then the ending just fucking destroys really? it so badly. Oh. And it's, it's called Dracula Untold. Right, and I've it's, never seen it. Oh, it's good. Just, just, just bear in mind what I've said about the ending. And if yes. you don't mind spoilers, I will just explain. No, no, please, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So it's Luke Evans, who's a really good actor anyway. And it's it's meant to be kind of like the, the origin of the character. Right. Yeah. So he is a Transylvanian prince, hmm. um, in, and he's got his kingdom, and they have no army, so to speak. It's just right. a small kingdom with his castle and a few villages around it. Right. The Turkish army is advancing over everything and they basically come and say, we want your kingdom and your wife and your children and everything. So this, I mean, and that's have... actually based in history as well. I mean, that's what yes, happened to Vlad Tepes. That is actually absolutely. what happened, you know? He, he has admitted they have no army at all. They don't have enough gold to pay for mercenaries or anything like that. But there is like a local witch woman or whatever who, who knows a myth about a, 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 some sort of dark god that lives in the hills. Right. And if you go to him, you can make a bargain of some sort. So Vladimir goes up into these hills and finds this dark god thing who's actually Charles Dance. Oh, oh, well, yeah, of course it would be, wouldn't it? I mean, if you're going to cast anyone as a dark god. Absolutely. He's this, like, ancient Greek (laughs) mythological demon thing that Uh lives in this cave, and he's been trapped there forever. But there is, as with all Greek mythological stuff, there's, like, a weird little rule, which is that if who's put in there or why, you never find out. But you don't need to, really. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Which is that if some human agrees to share his curse with him, then he can walk free. Oh, okay. Okay. But, and he says to Dracula, I will give you the power to fight this army, yeah. but it will cost you more than you can realize. Mm-hmm. And at some point, I'm going to come and ask you for a favor. Yeah, of course. There's always going to be a favor, isn't there? So Dracula agrees to this, and this thing bites him and then makes him drink its own blood. Mm-hmm. 
he wakes up in the next morning and the sun's hurting his eyes so he yeah. gets out of it and he like staggers and puts his hand against the wall and just punches straight through it immediately right. so he's like, Okay, so something's happened here. Yeah. And then it's a, he starts getting these cravings and stuff, but there's a scene which is genuinely one of my favourite Dracula scenes on a film where, you know, like we spoke about before, that in the books, in the book version, Dracula isn't just some dude with sharp teeth and that. He's like an entity of, yeah. of you know, almost cosmic sort of... If you ever want to see Dracula fight an army with his bare hands, <laughs> that's what you get in this film. <laughs> He, he, he marches out there and fights about 500 Turkish medieval warriors with his bare hands and just slaughters them. It's brilliant. Um, but then he starts getting this craving for bloodlust. Yes. And then he starts seeing his wife and child as food and he can't trust himself to be around them. So then there's a big battle at the end where he, 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 he full on like uses his power to, to command the storms and the wolves and all of that. And he defeats the Turkish army and, um, and the, the, the leader of the Turks uses weapons like silver and stuff against him because he's discovered what he is. But ultimately he wins. But then it's not a happy ending because he cannot trust himself to be around his loved ones anymore. Right. So he isolates himself in his castle and um, forever, basically. Yeah. yeah. Which is now the end of the film. Now this is where it goes wrong. I, was because say, I thought it, that was the end. That sounds no, like a good no, no. End. Because what it was supposed to be is that this film was going to be uh, the start of a shared monster universe. They had oh, another okay. attempt at this a few years ago with the mummy. Yeah, this is officially going to be, and Charles Dance was going to be the kind of Nick Fury character. Yeah. So at some point he was going to, you were going to see him in the Frankenstein movie. He'd he'd be he'd be the one that gives the secret ingredient to Victor Frankenstein that lets right. him resurrect the dead, and then he'd he'd be you know he, and then he'd be ultimately Hyde, you know, yes, he'd, he'd exactly, be the one yeah. that gives Jekyll the formula, presumably. Yes, yes. yeah. So. So that was why he said to Dracula that at some point I'm going to come back and ask you for this favour and all of that. But then at some point down... So the idea was Dracula would go back to his castle and then off screen the novel would take place. Yeah. And then the next time you see Dracula it's after the Bram Stoker novel. Right. And that's Right. But somewhere down the line, they then decided that they were going to set this shared monster universe in the modern day. Oh, which... <sighs> Okay. So what they did instead is that at the end of the film, instead of Dracula being isolated in his character, he flash forwards us to modern day Europe and he's just walking around happy as Larry and he's fine. So okay. this whole thing about him being cursed and unable to unable to be around people and the, the price he's had to pay for protecting his family yeah. is that he should never be with them again and all of that. It's he's undone. just pissed out the window yeah. because he's eating he's fine and he buys a woman a drink and he's you know and then Charles Dance turns up and says right it's time. So you think yeah. why couldn't you have just set it in Victorian times and done like a proper sort of what League of Gentlemen wanted to be you know. Yeah, League of yeah Gentlemen. right. Why couldn't you have just done that? Why this desire to set it in the modern day, yes, meaning that you have to undo that ending? Absolutely. And it, I mean, it's not it impossible to it. do. It can be done, but it really needs to be treated with, with incredible respect. It's very hard to do that sort of thing. A but lot of the adaptations have tried to set Dracula yes. in the present day, and it it's hard. I can't think of one off the top of my head that's even halfway successful. No, it it loses a lot of what you need. And and the problem with the untold ending is that it basically means the book never happened. So ironically, the last ten minutes now suggests that the book this film's meant to be a prequel to isn't is, actually is it, canonical to this right. film. Okay, so it actually kind of destroys itself. Yeah, you and know? you just think. Oh, it come, it leaves you coming away with such an annoying feeling because yeah. you think, oh, I'm enjoying this so much. And then it just <laughs> dropped the ball. It just yeah. dropped the ball. It is difficult, isn't it? I mean, my favourite adaptation of Dracula is one that most people don't like, which is the uh, Francis Ford Coppola's one from 1992. Is that not popular? Do people not like not that? at all, no. Um, what, te what I find tends to happen is people who like horror really like it. Yeah. generally speaking really like it um critics absolutely loathe it 
it what gets... reason did he give for that? Oh, you know what? I think most of the criticism centre around Keanu Reeves and and um, Winona Ryder. And okay, fine, I get that. Yeah, they they are kind of the weak links in it, you know. Yeah. Which is inevitable. It's fine. They're only in it because the studio said you've got to have someone who has sort of star quality, who's young and blah 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 blah. blah. Okay, fine. And maybe that's miscasting. Fine. But, Possibly. But you know what? I. I love the approach they took to it. What they did was they uh, clearly, clearly, when they were conceiving this film, they sat down round a table and somebody said, we can't tell this straight. Okay? If everybody knows this story already, it's been done a million times. There are at least like 30-odd Hammer Horror films based on Dracula, yeah? Not counting. Yeah, Dracula had at least 20. Right. Hammer had at least 25 plus. Right. No, not even counting the Universal film, all of the other like adaptations, the cartoons, the comic books. Everybody knows this story, so we're not going to tell it straight. What we're going to do, we're going to make this big bravura horror pantomime where instead of it being all dark and grey, it's actually going to be colourful and beautiful, and you're going to have reds and you're going to have ambers. the imagery in that is gorgeous. That scene where the, the, he's there in his wolf form in that garden. Mm, I love it's it to so bits. gorgeous, isn't it? I it's love it to bits. Beautiful bit. image of well, it. It just goes for it. I mean, you like you know when he when um, Keanu Reeves and Jonathan Harker goes up to the castle and he opens the door and Dracula is like he's old and he's kind of withered and he's not human looking at all. No, he's the not. Whole, it, it's it, like it, the it, film it. just knows and it knows the audience knows, so it just goes for it. Yeah, there's no attempt to disguise the fact that, no. that he's not a human being. He looks almost like a, a snake that's shedding its skin at so that point, right, doesn't yeah. it? Or like a maggot. He's got like a maggoty quality to him, doesn't he? Yeah. It's like, and you, there's the whole like, there's a slight horror campness to it, you know, with where his shadow is doing different things to him, where it's sort of strangling Jonathan Harker's shadow, you know? Yeah, the shadow are doing, yeah, it moves differently to him, doesn't it? I mean, they did that on The Simpsons, didn't did, they? they it's, the of it. yeah. <laughs> it's just it's so cool i i love that stuff it's so camp but i love it to bits you know the scene where jonathan harker cuts himself while he's shaving and yes. you get that wonderful close-up of gary oldman as dracula sort of running the razor across his tongue and going <sighs> it's like ah, oh, i love it I, I like that it because it bits. suggests that that nobility is very much like a front yeah. that he he drops he loses it yeah, as soon right. as he's in the sight of blood and that I think a lot of that was from the Christopher Lee version wasn't it Yeah I think so yeah because I don't like, think Bella Lugosi ever loses his cool like no, that does Bella it Bella Lugosi is totally cold all the way through he never even becomes like bestial or anything no like he that. doesn't no Whereas christopher lee starts hissing at a point yes and that's it his eyes go red he's got these really awful like glass contact lenses in that must have hurt like a son of a bitch yeah they're awful they yeah. send full eye contact lenses they which are. are the worst ones they have to like stretch the the eyelid to put them in yeah um and then he just can i just his... um, honorable mention now we spoke about this before we recorded but christopher lee's dracula has what i consider to be the best death in any yeah. film which is that he falls in a bush <laughs> all right you heard it here first ladies and gents so yeah he, uh, they, they add to the mythology which you're gonna do over time and say that thorn bushes hurt vampires because of the crown of thorns on jesus and all that oh, which kind of makes sense if you're gonna say that um the cross hurts them because of that then right. why not and Fair someone pushes enough. him off a castle barracks and he falls into a thorn bush and dies <laughs> so that's <laughs> That is like the most ignominious death, isn't it? I mean, it's terrible but brilliant at the same time. I mean, there comes a point where you have to question, you know, if they keep adding in all of these weaknesses to vampires, where it's like, well, what's the point? You know, if but that, so but, but that same weak, film, that, that, yeah, that same film is where they said that running water hurts them. But, right. but there's a scene where the the lake is frozen, so there's no running water. So someone fires at the lake with a rifle, and then water trickles out of that hole, and that's so him. Okay. You think, so what, what if you just turn your tap on or something or have a hose pipe is that gonna work yeah, as well so if you get like a hose pipe or something yeah. or a water pistol or something that's so it's silly so ridiculous but that's what you mean by these rules is like you start yeah. questioning them and you think nah hang on this is yeah. stupid 
I get why they do it because ultimately if the only weakness if you're making 25 films yeah. you can't have 25 films where you stick a stake in his heart no because it's all the same as it's boring of course it? it is so I get that but it, it does get a bit stupid once you're at the point of well, uh, uh, pushing him in a bush to be fair you know the Hammer horror films let's be fair they got to the point where you've got Dracula 1972 AD you know yeah. which is the stupidest film imaginable it's great fun. i forgot quite how camp that was until oh, a couple of years ago when i saw it again it's great fun i mean it is just so stupid i love it to bits it's so fun christopher lee is not having fun by the way no he you can tell he doesn't enjoy fun. that you well, he really can't yeah it. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to he do. No, no. Uh, he was done after the first few. After the first few Hammer horror films, he was done. But he was actually kind of strong-armed into doing it. Um, they. It, it wasn't that he was contractually obliged or anything like. He could have just said no. But he. 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 He quite eloquently states in a couple of his like interviews that what happened was the people who were making the films would phone him up and say, "Oh, well, you know, we were we were we were relying on you. Uh, there's all these people's jobs involved. So if you don't." Don't come and do it and it doesn't do well so he kind of felt obliged to do it you know that's a bit of a dick move right. though isn't it isn't it isn't it just so he felt kind of obliged but he isn't having fun <laughs> he doesn't no. want to do it does and what did, usually did, did... Did Sorry, Universal do any more Draculas apart I don't from think the classic? They did. No, I don't think there aren't any more Belly Lugosi ones. No, I didn't think there was. He never crops up in like because you know, like with the Frankenstein monster, they did loads of those, they didn't are, they? they like, absolutely I, I, tons. Some of them are really good. I mean, they're yeah, they not, are. They're not good adaptations of Frankenstein because the book is totally different from from that version of the monster. It's yes, it totally is. Yeah, different. Um, but I like that version for its own charms. The Boris Karloff one. Um, the Bride of Frankenstein is probably the mm. best of them. That is that is a stunner. Yeah, it's a beautiful film, but I just I just couldn't remember if because I know Bela Lugosi himself is in quite a lot of Universal pictures. Oh, he's in loads, isn't he? Of course, you know, most infamously, he's in Plan Nine from Outer Space. You know, yes. that Ed Wood made. They were good friends, weren't they? Him and Ed Wood, by all accounts. Yeah, apparently. So... I, I like the fact that Bela Lugosi's natural accent is what we think of as the Dracula voice. The Dracula voice, yeah. Because it's... he was asked to do a Shakespearean posh English accent, and he couldn't. <laughs> just couldn't. So not he do just spoke yeah. with his normal accent. And that is now, a hundred years later, well, what be, we think of as the Dracula you know, voice. To be fair, a, a, a sort of like a cod English accent doesn't doesn't make sense anyway because it's no, it doesn't. Davies, but it? The, yeah. the idea at that time, which to be honest, people still have that idea in filmmaking, is it's an old world character. Yeah. He must sound like he's from Oxford. He must they sound like that he, now. Yeah. They still do that now. Right, right. Anything medieval, you're not going to hear a Yorkshire accent. It's yeah. going to be someone that sounds like Benedict Cumberbatch. Back. Right, and you, vampires are particularly, they are particularly um, prone to that, aren't they? You yeah. Never, they're either like, they're either very, very eloquent and very sort of Oxford English, or they, they, you do sometimes get the sort of slight Cockney vampire. What do you think was the first sort of major pop culture thing that had vampires who were basically not upper class? Oh, would you say, would you say uh, Lost Boys or? I think it probably was the Lost Boys, you know, because also that one introduces something new, which is the American vampire, of course. You know, the um, the colonial vampire. Yes. Um, and also, you know what I like about the Lost Boys as well? I mean, Kit, Kit, I'm so Kit Power is going to hate me for this because he hates the Lost Boys. He really I know he does. He's not a Kit, fan, is he? I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I love it a bit. I've got a real thing for it. Uh, um, and, and I know it's shit. I know, right? Okay, I know. I know it's a bad film, but I, I just love it. I love it to bits. It's um, one of them that if you watch it at the right time, right. you hold a special sort of nostalgic yeah. place for as it. As a kid, I, I just Do you know what? I, so I, I, I feel that way about the super mario brothers film yeah yeah right it's, it's... so i know it's a bad film but yeah. i watched it when i was about eight years old massively into super mario so i just fucking love right, it i know, know that it's shit but... I, this is this is complete <laughs> bullshit but i know how to spin it right i was a young gay kid I thought the vampires were hot, so if you don't if you don't accept my liking of the Lost Boys, you're being homophobic. So there. That's a good gal. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, but what I mean, in all seriousness, one of the things I actually do really admire about the Lost Boys is that it's one of the first vampire films I have ever seen that actually captures like the youthful exuberance of being a vampire. 
Yeah, what if you become immortal as a teenager? What right. if you come and become immortal as a young man well, rather than an old man in your yeah. castle longing for the days of gold and you well, know that? You've got this tagline, haven't you? You'll never grow old. You'll never die. Party all night, sleep. Party all night, sleep all day. Yeah. Well, it was it, obviously as per the name suggests, the Lost Boys were sort of like a sinister version of Peter Pan, wasn't it? Of course it, it was. Of course it was. And you know, the vampire mythology is a great way of doing that. Yeah, it is. It really is. Because it's just, what if you can live like that, but there's a price, which is you've got to take the lives of others. Yeah, right. Which is, do you know what? I don't think this was ever intended, but you could almost see a subtext there as to why vampires are traditionally upper class wealthy people. Because people that wealthy always get there by basically draining the life out of other people. Whether it was intended or not, there is a Marxist reading of Dracula. Of course there is. In the same way there is of almost any text, you know? And there is a classism inherent, isn't there? Yeah, it you is. never you never become a billionaire without having drained the fortunes right? of some other people's That's, hard work and that. That is implicit, surely. Dracula sustains by draining the blood of the of the lower class villagers. That's what he's always doing. Of course doing. he does. Yeah. yeah. But um yeah but I do think yeah, I do think the Lost Boys is the first one I can think of where it was full on these could be kids, they could be right. punks, it could be and young it you know, could poor people. Be also that it could be fun. You know, yeah, that's what I that's like true. about it. It's the fact, what I love about The Lost Boys is it, it captures the ambiguity of it. Okay, yeah, they're monsters. They're absolute monsters and killers. You know, they're, they're sadistic. But I can see the appeal. I yeah, because see... one, in, in Salem's Law, uh-huh. the kids seem to enjoy it, but they also yes. seem to be like in a delirium, like they're hypnotized by the master vampire, right. as opposed to The Lost Boys, where it's absolutely their free will. Oh, it's absolutely, they love it. You know, they're enjoying it. And the fact that you, I mean, in between that, you've got Michael, of course, who is sort of like kind of enjoying it, but at the same time has his familial responsibilities and whatnot. So, mm. Oh, actually, I just thought... Um, what about uh, Fright Night? Is that before Lost Boys? Fright or after? Night, you, I think Fright Night was before. Because he's kind of blue collar, isn't he? He is a little bit. Yeah, so that may have been the one. That may have been the one that brought vampires down to earth a little bit. Outside yeah. of the towers and, you know, yeah. into suburbia. Into, I suppose, I mean, I suppose Salem's Lot, the book, would have been. The fir- one of the first to do that to bring vampires to suburbia, yeah. Yeah, it would, I suppose. But there's still kind of that societal hierarchy thing involved in there, isn't there? Oh, definitely. It's... I mean, Barlow's rich, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. It's a big, rich old guy, and then his right. servants. Right. There is definitely that still. But the fact that you have a vampire in suburbia is was at the time really. I mean, it, it's obviously you know <laughs> they're everywhere in fiction these days, and you can't move for vampires apparently in suburbia now. No, um, I think Buffy was very strongly influenced by the Lost Boys. He, even even the look of the vampires is yeah, is very similar. Totally, yeah. And also, I mean, with Buffy, you get the the popular um, crystallization of the sexy vampire. You know, the, yeah. the tortured vampire, the one who doesn't really want. To to hurt people and i mean it comes from interview with the vampire obviously that's it's not the first to do it but it is the one that most people think of it's the one that made it iconic and it's the one that where it sort of derives from you know the Anne rice yeah. vampire essentially the it's it's the louis vampire you know the one who is a reluctant vampire who doesn't really want to kill people and you know what i'm i'm with lestat Quite frankly, I'm with Lestat. At least Lestat fucking enjoys it, you know? I actually really liked... um, Did you watch all of Buffy and Angel? Were you you into that? I I did watch Buffy, yeah. I don't think I watched Angel, which is ironic, given that Angel would probably be... should be the one I'd I'd prefer, you know? (laughs) Well, I actually think Angel was a vastly superior series, but (laughs) but, but, uh, I like the kind of... um, um, comparison between angel and spike because obviously quite later on spike himself gets his soul back yes, so he course. becomes a, a hero and he he joins he, he, on the final season of angel he's in that and yes, fights alongside yeah. angel but there's he, their attitudes are very different yeah. and i like that because they are both vampires who in the past were like the worst of yeah. the worst and now the good guys 
but their attitude to that is massively different. Because Angel is like, oh, I did such terrible things and I need to sit in this castle and stare at the rain all day thinking about what I did. (laughs) Whereas Spike is like, you know what? I were a vampire. I did vampire shit. I'm doing better now. Can't change that. That's the end of it. Yeah, move on. That's, yeah. And I, I much prefer that yeah, because I, I also think Spike is a vastly superior vampire because he blends with the modern day. Yeah. He can use a computer. Yeah. He, he knows how to dress modern. He knows how to slip into a nightclub and, and yeah. buy a girl a drink and that. Angel, the second he walks in anywhere, you say, that's a vampire. That's a vampire. Yeah, absolutely. He, he, he stands out a mile. Uh, he, 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 <laughs> you know, even though he did give me my love of long coats. But, yeah, it, right. it, it's, <laughs> but yeah, I think vampire is a, a, Spike is a much better predator as a yeah. vampire because he, he, he can slip straight into the modern day and you don't don't know well, just like what i said earlier with the oh, i'll set your house on fire thing that's well, an example of that there is a line in like at the end of interview with the vampire you know where lestat is in the journalist's car and he plays the tape of the interview that the journalist has had with louis and yeah. he says something along the lines of oh, whining whining still whining yeah. <laughs> and he says you you hear that i've had to listen to that for years and i'm like <laughs> yeah i'm you know what i'm totally with you Lister. have you um have you read preacher the preacher books i haven't no there's, do you know what they're about? Have you seen I the TV? I know what they're about, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the characters in that is a vampire called Cassidy, who's right. an Irish. If you imagine... Oh, Christ, what's his name from the Pogues? What's the singer's oh, name? Oh, I, like the lead singer. Yeah, what's his name? <laughs> I can't remember his name. Is it Shane McGowan? I can't remember his name. I'll but if you, if you just imagine him and how he acts yeah. as a vampire, that's basically... Cassidy, right? Right, right, okay. And there's a scene where he goes to this bar. All he is, he's a World War One soldier, yeah. and, and they're on manoeuvres in this little French swamp, uh-huh. and he gets attacked by this, like, bog witch thing who's a vampire, <laughs> right. okay. and he, she bites him, and he wakes up the next morning, and he's a vampire. He doesn't know anything about it. He tries to carry on his normal life, but he can't, mm. so he just kind of lives as best as he can. Right, right. He, he only attacks, like, criminals and stuff because he doesn't yeah. want to, you know. But there's a scene where, in the modern day, where he discovers, like, a bar full of other vampires. Right. So he thinks, okay. oh, I'll meet some of my own kind. And he's sat next to one who's got the long white hair and yeah. he's wearing a... This is, like, in 2010. Yeah. And he's, like, wearing a cape and he's <laughs> sat there talking about the tragedy of their existence. <laughs> Cassidy, Cassidy just goes, oh, God, you're a wanker, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm with him. I'm totally with him. I mean, there is there is this kind of innate joyousness to the state of, of vampirism, isn't there? You know, yeah. the fact that it is so carnal, the fact that it is so it's freeing, isn't it? That's that's what's attractive about the notion of being a vampire. It's the fact that it's freeing. It frees you from all constraints, you know? So something that if, if we if we can come on to the um the newer adaptation that the BBC have just done. Ah yes, the Christmas one. Something that I there were a few elements that I liked in that, but yeah. something I did like is the fact that the the, the trail that vampirism leaves that even yeah. the people he doesn't turn are like zombified remnants right. of things. It's like everywhere you go is just a trail of misery that's caused by it. Yeah. You can't just cleanly drink someone, leave the body, and walk away yeah. because that that's going to get up as a shambling corpse. Right. It's, I quite liked that because that made it seem more like a disease. Right. I mean, it's one of those weird things. The BBC have done lots of adaptations of Dracula. There was a terrible one about a decade ago, um, which basically it was so what annoyed me about it was that it tried you know the subtext of the original book with well, the subtext is venereal disease you know and yes, this is, this is it very is, yeah. clear this is actually quite clear it tried to make that overt so it made vampirism a direct and actual venereal disease and it's like oh yes. man, come on fuck off we get it we're well, not idiots you know we're not fools we know the subtext of the story but this new one this new one, I mean, I I must admit, I went into it with a bit of cynicism because Moffat, Moffat as a writer, I, and I know it's trendy to hate on Moffat. I know I just don't like, I just That's don't like enough. him as a writer. I think he's really arrogant. I think his writing is, unless he's controlled, like you know when he writes individual episodes of something beneath a head writer, he's good. 
I yeah. think he can actually do really good work. But when he's in control of a project, it goes completely off the rails. <laughs> this show of his went the way everything he's ever written yeah. does, which yeah. is the really slow build up and yeah. then massive info dump at the end, aren't yeah. I clever? Yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, that's how he does everything. Sherlock, Doctor yeah. Who, Torchwood, this, everything he's done, that is how he does it. Not Jekyll. Torchwood, sorry, he didn't write that. Jekyll, but, yeah. do you remember that? Jekyll, Jekyll yeah. There, which was absolutely atrocious. <laughs> it was terrible. But that that was my fear going in. And you know what? There were elements of it that were really problematic and that I really didn't like. But it was... There were parts of it that were better than I thought they were going to yes. be, basically. I thought, you know, in the opening episode, it did the build-up well. The yeah, gothic I liked stuff, the opening episode, yeah. yeah. The gothic stuff was great. I loved all that. I, I love liked... the fact that the blood gives you knowledge from the person he's taken it from. Well, that was really quite clever, because it explains lots about the character, doesn't it? It gives you... It lets him move into the modern world right. more quickly. It also let, it also explains that, like, as I said, you, you're either having vampirism as a mystical thing, yeah. or a flat-out disease. Right. If it's a flat-out disease, then blood is blood, the same way you or I eat food. Right. But That's if it. it's a mystical thing, then you are literally draining the life out of somebody, yeah. then why wouldn't you take a piece of their memories as well it makes sense doesn't it, it? does make sense it does yeah. make sense and i i liked that i like i liked like you know the scenes where jonathan harker was in the castle and the castle was twisting and like, yes. becoming non-euclidean around him it was going slightly lovecraft i liked yes. that um i liked some of the imagery i thought the some of the imagery was really stark and unpleasant and i was like oh yeah that's good i like that what I didn't like was Dracula. I did, the actor. I don't know whether it was the actor or the direction that he was given, but almost from the instant he opened his mouth, I was <laughs> like, what are you doing? Well, <laughs> it was like, what director lets an actor get away with that? He seemed a bit like... Um, and now this is something you see in a lot of... If you watch Moffat's Doctor Who era, yeah. you, you see a lot of this in that. He seemed like someone who... I do suddenly so. It's like they're basically from the modern day, but you happen to have put them in a Victorian thing. Yeah. That... So like you'll, you'll be watching Doctor Who, and it will be the Moffat era, yeah. and it's set in Shakespearean England. Right. And then... A woman will turn up and act like she's from London in 2020. Yes, yes I know exactly what you mean, and that's uh, exactly it. And it yeah. wasn't just Dracula either. Like a no, lot, it wasn't. A lot it of wasn't. the characters, that nun as well. The, nun the Van was Helsing like that. nun. The Van Helsing yeah. nun. Yeah, they talked and they used mannerisms and modes of speech that were way too modern, way too present day, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, and that he does that a lot. Yeah. And I think if you've got a couple of characters that do it, you can kind of get away with it. But yeah. when it's your main character it just doesn't work it just doesn't work and it's such a shame because there were elements of it i thought were really promising you know the second episode on board on board the demeter yes. i thought that was really good just as a standalone like piece yeah. you know i thought it was really good i liked all of the characters i liked like the slight murder mystery thing that was going on i thought that was clever i did but there was a two things about that that bothered me one of which was by that episode, I was already worried yeah. because I thought if they haven't even got off the Demeter yet, right. how much are they cramming into episode three? Right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. also the power levels of that character in that version were all over the place. Very like in, in episode one, it's quite, there's a scene where Dracula stood outside that abbey and there's that massive iron gate. Mm -hmm. And she says, uh, he says something. Says something about the nun. Says something about why don't you just come in? Yeah. And he says, "Oh, maybe I can't get through that gate." And she says, "Please, you could break that apart with your bare hands." Right. Because she's suggesting that you can't come in unless I ask you. Yeah. But then on the next episode, two men hold him down while he's sick. Yeah. Yeah. You think what? No, mm -hmm. if he's strong enough to break a gate like that with his bare hands, you're talking like Spider-Man levels of strength right, here. Yeah, which of course, <laughs> yeah. And you then, the, then you get the third episode. Yeah, God. Where it, just, it does Moffat, doesn't it? That was the Moffat for yeah. me. It's it's where it jumped the shark completely. And I was like, oh no. Oh no. I also find myself with with like um this wasn't strictly relating to to, to Dracula himself, but I had myself like a 
Do you ever have those? Those. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't actually know how old you are, George, but I'm. I'm, I'm thirty-six. Ah, oh, right. Well, it's, it's my thirty-fifth birthday, in March. So we're right, all about the right. same. So we're kind of the same age, really. You know. Do you ever have those moments where you think, "Am I? Have I got left behind here as as time moved on without me? Because I don't feel like this." Do you know what I mean? When yeah. you're watching pop culture or something, oh, you God, kind of yeah, feel like Yeah, I get it yeah. all the time. I get it yeah, all the time. The, the, was, the, the scenes with, with Lucy's character, uh-huh. before he turns her, yeah. where she is basically like sleeping with everyone, yeah. leading on all these different guys, breaking men's hearts left and right, uh-huh. and it was almost sold as if we were supposed to applaud her for that. Right, right, yeah. And I'm watching that thinking, am I just kind of a bit of an old man (laughs) because I don't see anything likeable about this character at all. I think she's awful. The whole whole (laughs) sort of like Oh, I'm down with the youth culture element. Yeah. Of it. I was talking to a friend of mine who who also likes this kind of literature over the weekend, and he described it as, you know, when you've got your uncle, so he's a little he's a little bit over the hill, uh, but he's still going to nightclubs and things, and still trying to kick <laughs> it with the kids. It kind of had that element to it. It was like it was trying to pretend that it knew what youth culture is or what young people yeah. are like, and it was totally wankery total bullshit obviously yeah. uh, and therefore became embarrassing it actually it became was, rather because, embarrassing yeah because I, I just saw her the way she was and everything and i thought are young people actually like this because no, they're not, it's not well, pleasant is no, it it's, it's not a nice character it's, that it's no, a... it was i mean you know there were certain elements of it where i could see glimmers of good ideas i liked the fact for example that lucy was this almost nihilist you know? Yes, that made more sense with Dracula then being able to seduce her. Right, so. right. I liked that. I thought that was. And really I also cool. liked the fact that he was just completely messing her about. Yeah, yeah. Because again, if you're gonna do him as evil, do him as evil. Do him don't as evil, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But then you get the bullshit redemptive arc at the end. Oh God, what was that? But it, again, it was that was classic Moffat. As in the last ten minutes, I'm gonna right. throw everything in there because I'm proper clever, right. like Sherlock Holmes solving a mystery. You know, I it's. Mean, it's the redemptive arc worked in like the Bram Stoker's Dracula version because you saw at the beginning the fact that he was damned by love you yes. know? so it makes sense in that one in this one it doesn't it comes out of nowhere there's right. no build up for he's, it it's not he's, earned is it he's it's... a total monster all the way through he is a total sadistic monster all the way through and then you get like in the last five minutes this kind of bullshit redemptive arc and it's like no no yeah I don't This buy idea it. that, oh, I actually want to die, and all I that. And like, from when? When has that been suggested at any point? When, right? <laughs> he, yeah. he has been having a ball all the way through. Oh, he's loving it. He's yeah. loving it. There's no suggestion of guilt. No. There's no suggestion of anything at all. There is and then it's just dropped in at the end. Right, right. And it, it just didn't work for me. Uh, the last episode was, it was conceptually a mistake for me i agree yeah i i think the idea of moving it to the modern day could have worked it was it could have been quite a clever twist it it, it could have done something with that but it, it just what they chose to do with it wasn't great it was so badly handled wasn't it it was so badly handled i just couldn't i couldn't deal with it i couldn't it also i mean for me it felt like almost everyone involved knew that they were in a production it felt too yeah, conscious. Yeah, that's an interesting observation, you know? yeah. It felt too conscious of itself, and I'm like, no. I mean, I got that from the Dracula character almost from the beginning. You know, when he sat, when he finally gains access to the Abbey, and he sat as the wolves are devouring the the nuns, and he's going, ooh, mmm, ooh, that's nasty. I was like, oh, fuck off. You know, that's, yeah. just, that's just ridiculous. Do you know what I always think with scenes like that, um, and I, I, I must admit, I get this a lot in the Blade films as well, yeah, yeah. Um, is when I ask myself who is he saying this for right yeah is there no one is alive around? to hear this now yeah yeah you almost you almost want to go up to them don't you say who are you talking to yes blade <laughs> does it a lot yeah. like he'll kill a vampire and then turn around and pose and you think who's that for yeah who's right? stood watching you it's such a sort of it's... retrograde thing to do as well as it? it's yeah. very 1990s isn't it it's very 1990s filmmaking very very and but yeah i always saw that like as he said the walls are the tearing everyone apart and he's 
sat there and he's making little jokes. You're right. like, who, who's that for? Who's yeah. that benefiting? Is, is, he, is he amusing himself? Like, what? Who cares? It's just, yeah, it didn't do it for me. It didn't do it. No, for me. but I didn't. I didn't like that. And I, I there were elements, there were scenes with him where I thought yeah. he could have been so good as well. There right. were some scenes where I thought, oh, yeah. giving him if he'd given him more like this, yeah, that's it, it. Would have been great. The Dracula character I found was all over the place. He was yeah. all over the place. So sometimes he was like this cynical and funny guy. Sometimes he was just an outright monster and sadist. Sometimes there were there were moments where you could think that he was almost like uh, a tortured soul or whatever. But if just... you're going to have him as this tortured soul who ultimately sacrifices himself, you've got to lay the groundwork right. for that do it. earlier yeah. on. Go for it and do it, yeah? As it is in Bram Stoker's Dragon, you know, in the Francis Ford Coppola one. Okay, in yes. that one, he is totally monstrous he's a real evil son of a bitch but you know why yes and you see where the damage is yeah and also you've got to have that if you're going to do that ending otherwise you've not earned it exactly and also i mean you have the very clever subplot which is not in the book by the way none of the romantic stuff is in the book but i think it's actually better than what's in the book where yeah i agree you have the notion that mina is the reincarnation of elizabeth his wife yeah, that's brilliant. I, I actually like that. think that's kind of become part of the mythology now. It has, hasn't, it? hasn't it? People actually assume that that is part of the original book, and it's not. It's definitely not. It's not, but I like it, and it, it feels like it's worthy of adding to the, the mythology, because I think that's a great idea. I mean, the ending of the book is actually one of the weakest parts of it. It's such an anticlimax. He's, yeah. he's, he, he's just... In the book, what happens is he's escaped from London, like Quincy and Van Helsing and and um, Jonathan Harker and uh, Doctor Doctor What's His Face Morris, is it? They are Quincy Morris, yeah. They, they yeah. are following him, Doctor Seward, Doctor Seward, isn't Seward, it? Seward, sorry, um, Seward, yes. Yeah. They are following him across the sea and across Transylvania as he's trying to get back to his castle, and they just overtake him before the sun sets and they just kill him in his coffin. Yeah, there's not even a big fight. Nope. Or anything. Yeah, no. No, nope, there isn't. That's it. Whereas the Francis Ford Coppola one has that in it. It has that moment in yes, it. Yes. But the but sun goes down. There's a bit more drama to it, isn't there? They add more drama and they add more pathos to it, actually. Because he bursts out of his coffin with all yes. of the dirt and he kills, I think he kills Quincy, if I remember correctly. Um... And in the book, Quincy's killed by one of the, um... One of the, the Count's servants, I believe. Yes. Um... And but then he is he's actually killed by Mina and he asks her to do it. Yeah. He's had enough. He's just had enough. He's this ancient, ancient creature who's just had enough. And he has a little bit of redemption from that. It works yeah, in that story, it, it, you know? it does. And the fact that it's her as well yeah. really, really ties in with what they did in that version. Right, it does. It really does work. I, I really like that version of the story. In fact, thus far, that's my favourite. Well, I liked... Yeah, that probably is mine as well. But the, the elements that make the Dracula Untold one mm-hmm. so strong in my mind is the same... This is a strange comparison, but I will justify it. It's the same thing that I liked about the Rogue One Star Wars Oh, film. okay, that is a strange one. <laughs> because Dracula, like Darth Vader, uh-huh. is a character who, owing to the limitations of cinema production at the time these characters became famous, right. we are told to accept a lot without ever being shown it. Yes, yeah. So these are both characters who are meant to be supremely powerful, uh-huh. godlike beings, but we never actually see anything no. to suggest that. You're absolutely right. I never thought of it, but you are absolutely correct. Whereas with Dracula Untold, you see him fighting an army right. on his own. Like I said earlier, with Rogue One, you see Vader taking on an army of rebels effortlessly yeah. on his own. And you actually get to see, this is what happens if someone who isn't a Jedi goes up against Darth Vader. Right, yeah. This and is it. fucking hopeless. Yeah. They have no chance. There, there's, a, there's a video game that I've just finished, which is called um oh christ jedi fallen order it's yeah a new, yeah the new one yeah and the last level of that uh after your character's fully leveled up you've learned all the moves you've got all the force powers vader turns up and you have to sort of hold him off and he's yeah. ridiculous <laughs> you suddenly feel like it's like 
me going to the gym every day, for the, which I do anyway, but for like the next six months and really caning the protein shakes yeah. and that and thinking, yeah, I'm fucking brilliant now. And then Dwayne Johnson turns up yeah. in the same gym. Yeah. And you're like, you're like ah, actually, yeah. Okay. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. shown me where I am. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like that because you cannot do anything against Fader when you fight yeah. him at the end of that game. It just it's, Your efforts against him are just pitiful. Right. And it's and it's 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 the same thing what... with Dracula, isn't it? It's kind yes. of the same thing. You know, you are told that this you guy... are always told that he's this godlike dark yeah. power, and yet you never see it because the films didn't have the capability. Hammer certainly didn't have that budget. Universal didn't have the the, the capability didn't exist. Right, right. And so it's... as with Star Wars, the original Star Wars films, all you ever see of Vader is this slow moving guy in a black suit. Right, yeah. You never see him kick off, do you? Not really. He never like full on you know, tears a space station down or anything right. like that. It, it, it's just not there in the yeah. films until you get to Rogue One and the new video games and stuff. Okay. There's actually one of my favourite scenes that displays his power is in one of the new comic books. Yeah. Um, because there is something I've always kind of, I know this is a quick diversion, but something I've always kind of wondered about Vader is, it's quite apparent in the Star Wars films that when they made the first one, uh, they hadn't decided that he was Luke Skywalker's dad. Yes, so clear. He doesn't, know, he doesn't know it's him. Right, he, right. He, so he meets this kid. He knows he's called Skywalker, which is, hang on, that's yeah. my surname. Right, and he right. never makes the connection. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe it's a common name. I don't know. I know. But, but by the second one, he obviously knows because they've decided that that's going to be the thing. Yeah. But in, in they try to retroactively correct that in the comic books so that the, you see the scene where he discovers that. Right. And he, he, because he's got this theory that the Emperor's been keeping something from him. And when he finds out what it is that actually your children survived and they exist now and they're alive, there's a scene where he's he's got these spies looking into this for him. And Vader is stood on on the the Star Destroyer, one of the Star Destroyers, looking out of the window. And this guy comes and tells him, Oh, your children are alive. We found them. One of them's called Princess Leia. One of them's Luke Skywalker. Um, and Vader just doesn't react at all. So this guy just sort of slinks away. And then the last panel is Vader just staring out of the window, and then it suddenly just cracks. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. As if just smash the fist into it, but yeah. you don't see him move. And it just goes like boom, and it just cracks. And that is brilliant. Yeah. But there's nothing like that on the film. Nope. Yep. The sheer force it would take to crack a window on the Star Destroyer. Right. And he just does it without even moving. Yeah. And you think, that is the force that we are told he is, yeah. but we never see it. And until the Dracula Untold film, it's the same for Dracula. You just have to take a lot on faith. You really. are right. I mean, I mean, and in a way, that's something that derives from the original text, you know? When, yes. when Van Helsing turns up, Van Helsing obviously knows all about Dracula, and he knows all about vampires, he knows all about the occult law, and he starts talking about how this man, this creature, is the most evil thing in all creation, he's the most un- godly unholy thing to ever walk god's green earth but he is also this slinking coward who sort of has to creep into women's bedrooms you know and also gets chased off ultimately not by an army no just a group of guys you know if he's this guy who's got this like superman level of power then why on earth does he act so subtle why doesn't he just wade into the place he wants to go he's like fucking come and have a go and stop me then if you want and why did he get chased (laughs) off by a group of five men they could have explained that with some clever dialogue by yeah. saying that subconsciously he still thinks of himself as human yeah. or you go down that line of um i often think with immortality if you were immortal you would become so paranoid mm. about death that you would be like that billionaire guy who had the tissue oh, boxes the tissue cheap. boxes yeah yeah <laughs> because like for you or me or anyone else death is something that we're gonna is gonna happen at yeah, some point you just learn to I, accept it don't you it might be, hopefully, you, you know, in your 90s, you're dying your sleep, but it might be that you get it by a bus tomorrow. You right. don't know. But you at some point, know. it's going to happen. But if you have that removed from you, mm-hmm. and you're not in, invincible, you can still die, but the length of time that you're going to live has been extended to the infinite, but it could still be snatched from you at any moment. I think you would become so paranoid right. that you would just avoid conflict at all costs, and, and also, that would explain Dracula's behaviour, but I they never so. say that, do they? They don't also, say that. 
I mean, given that Dracula is a metaphysical vampire, he knows that there is a wider metaphysics to to being, yeah? Yes. So having lived for so long and having done such terrible things, maybe he's afraid that when he dies there will be some kind of a hell awaiting him or some sort of punishment, you know? Well, absolutely. This is the thing, like, someone... Uh, I don't know if it was you I was talking to, but someone once said to me about, like, oh, would you make a deal with the demon to become rich and famous? And I would say, well, well for me... I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in heaven and hell or anything like that. But if I met a demon, I would immediately know that that means hell is real. Right, right. So, no, I'm not going to sell my soul because then I would forever be worrying about the fact that when I die, that is where I'm going because I made a deal with a demon. And also, I mean... If you if you are going to meet something like a demon or say a djinn or something like that, yeah. it can give you almost anything. I'd want a little bit more than being rich or famous. Well, that's yeah, right. That might be a, right. a shallow example, but do you get my point? Yeah, is that I know what you, you are mean. suddenly aware yeah. that oh, hell exists. Then. Right, right. Yeah, you need so... to sort of just redraw your metaphysics a little bit, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, and I always think that with with these like Catholic mafia guys, to be honest. But if you genuinely believe in, in yeah. God, which Catholics claim to do, how can you reconcile that with being a mafia? Sort of right, right, yeah. <laughs> it's so bizarre, isn't it? It is so bizarre. But then again, that's happened down the centuries. I mean, you look at the Crusades, for example. Yeah. Well, no, but the Pope gives them absolution, exactly. didn't he? Exactly, this is it. In, in, is a, in advance, the Pope said, oh, anything you do is and, fine. And, and, and when, he, when they say anything, they mean anything. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, the but, litany but, of atrocities that they committed is unbelievable. So with, with, with Dracula, yeah, you're right. Right. He, he knows that heaven and hell is a real and everything, and he's, there's no doubt about which one he's going to go to. Oh, no, because well, he is like an avatar of it, isn't he? He's basically yes. like the devil himself almost. But there's no mention of that fear of death, the, the, the explaining his reluctance to get into conflict, because, yes, he does have the power to take on an army on his own, yeah. but all it takes is one lucky guy with a state to just run in there. And he's done, and basically. He's got him. And his fear of that, I think, would be paramount, given that he was immortal. Mm -hmm. And that would make him avoid conflict like something of a coward. Yeah, but, right. But they don't say that. We've had to kind of assume that that's the reason. <laughs> and not that it's just slightly poorly written. Brilliant. Absolute brilliance. I mean, what, I mean, to be fair, there are certain limitations built into the character. Like, for example, the fact that he needs to sleep in his own earth. So the earth yeah. from beneath the castle, basically. Um, so in order for him to come to the UK, he's got he's to gotta bring boxes full of earth, of Transylvanian yeah. earth, to sleep I in. do like that idea, though, that you're going to have this power, but there's going to be some severe limitations yeah, to right. it that make you question whether it's worth it i do like that I like that's that. something that's the kind of thing that gets more and more stripped away as we get into the modern sexy oh, vampires absolutely. isn't it because yeah, I mean, like what what limitations does edward cullen have for instance oh yeah and they don't know, even have to drink blood do no, they in the twilight I thing i don't think they do ultimately i don't think so there's they. nothing there's no yeah. downside is there yeah. it's... and that ironically removes a lot of the attraction from them it makes them like teflon doesn't it it makes them yeah. frictionless and uninteresting i mean i think the sexy vampire stuff can be done well it's very 1990 but one of the uh, one of the novels that I immediately think of is uh, Lost Souls by oh, yeah. uh, uh, Poppy, uh, Billy Martin uh, writing as uh, Poppy Z. Bright. Yeah? Um, yeah, that is a hot novel. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> hell! <laughs> and, you know, gay guy. It, it, it's a gay novel as well. I think that may be one of the first examples of like overtly gay vampires. To be honest, vampires is quite uh, open to homoeroticism because so it is. They don't limit the self to right. the male vampires get female victims no. and the female vampires get male victims. So, so they are in, inherently intimately involved with other other men and yeah. other women, aren't they? Yeah, and because also, you, you're I mean, not limiting you, yourself. No, and if you accept that they are immortal and they've lived for God knows how long, you're going to try, aren't you? <laughs> you know what I, I mean? think that. I, that is something I like when this show Dracula has been sort of bisexual, yeah. is that idea that after this length of time, you'd at least try the opposite I mean, of also, what you usually go for. Why would you care? I mean, why would you care about, like, definitions or parameters of any kind? I mean, if you point? if you were, how old is Dracula? Six, seven hundred years old? Yeah, he's, 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 he's fairly fucking old, yeah. He's, if you'd have lived that long, you'd have at least had a go with one woman, surely. Absolutely, yeah. But probably more, to be honest. I mean, if I, if I were in that position, it would be just a 
just a complete harem every day. Be <laughs> um, you would, yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd just abandon any notions of traditional type and anything like that. Or identity. Yeah. All of that wouldn't be meaningless, surely. On that timeline, and in, from that perspective, surely any parameter would be absolutely meaningless. And that's what I like about Lost Souls, actually. It does capture that. You know, the vampires in that are all youthful. They're all exuberant. And they just... It's just excess, you know? Yeah. It's just complete youthful excess. It's the it's the drugs, it's the sex, it's the violence, it's everything. It's brilliant. I love it to bits. That I have got I uh, in my book series which is starting this year i don't really have vampires like the ghost related one i've kind yeah. of steered away from them because i just think they're a slightly overdone trope to um, be honest it's hard to do them in the wake of twilight isn't it Let's it face is it. um but i think zombies are getting that way as well yeah, to be honest in the wake of the walking dead you know what i mean while i i, I do a, a, quite a bit of editing for some small presses yeah and the amount of zombie apocalypse fiction I get. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is that whilst I don't have a vampire character, one of my main characters uh, from the third book onwards is an immortal. Right. And, and what I've done with him is this idea that it's kind of a burden. Mm. He always wanted to be immortal and he gains it, but then it, it, it's just awful yeah. because it's almost as if the body reacts to things because of the limitation of it yeah so like alcohol's nice because it slightly poisons you yeah and, yeah you know, the drugs are nice because they do something to your body that it's kind of not meant to do but if you've now got this body which he, he's got the what's called the flame of prometheus inside him um you know the myth about yeah prometheus so he, flame to the to right. the, the yeah. Uh, well, in the actual myth, it's just flame. But in this yeah. version, I said that it actually meant immortality. What the yeah, gift? So that it's a metaphor. Prometheus. Basically. Yeah, the gift that Prometheus stole from the gods was literally immortality, and it's hidden away somewhere in the form of flame, hmm. in buried within the earth. And he, this guy finds it, and he absorbs it, and he becomes immortal. But he cannot die at all. So his body regenerates anything at all. Mm -hmm. He doesn't age, but that means he can't get drunk. Yeah. It means that drugs don't affect him. Mm -hmm. It means that sex doesn't feel good for him because right. uh, the way that your cells die when you have sex mm -hmm. is what sort of creates some of the euphoria. It's the French yeah. call an orgasm the little death. Yes, don't the le petit yeah. Yeah, le petit yeah. Yeah. He can't even experience pleasure through that mm -hmm. because everything that requires your body to experience a little bit of losing of itself mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because yeah, so because his body's permanently as fast as you lose a cell, his body regenerates it. So there's a so there is can't. a wider discussion to be had there, isn't there, about like the perspective of the immortal? Yeah. Well, he ultimately becomes massively depressed. Yeah. And just constantly tries to kill himself, but he can't. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting because it has overlap with certain science fiction stories, doesn't it? You know, yes. um, if you look at, say, Altered Carbon, for example, where yes, you have the yes, notion yes. that you you can be just transplanted into a new body, you know, and you yeah. can just keep going forever and ever and ever. And what does that do to you in terms of perspective? Well, I um, think that's, that would be a very interesting study because... <laughs> you would still be able to experience those pleasures. And yeah. each time you got a new body, would it be like experiencing them for the first time right. again? Right. Whereas versus the character of mine, who is just perpetual numbness. Yeah. It's just continuous, yeah? So I'd imagine, it, is he like seeking a high all the time? Is he like trying to find something that can yes, stimulate him? He is. And what he ultimately does is he ends up doing something he's never done in his entire existence, which is helping other people. Right, right. He ends up being like a bit of a, not a hero as such, but he ends up being altruistic and he helps people and he and he gains some measure of joy from that. Yeah, so it was vicarious joy, yeah? Yes, because he's like, oh, I can help other people. And he's never done that. He's always been entirely about him. Right, so he kind of gains some joy through that. Well, but... actually, now that, now that you mention it, there is almost like an overlap there between the vampire and the Cenobites in many respects. Because like the, the Cenobites, when they occur in Hellraiser, are these incredibly jaded creatures, aren't they? Because they, yeah, they've, they've experienced everything. <laughs> yeah. everything, you know, to the utmost extreme. And they're just bored. Yeah, they get their pleasure from doing it to other people yeah, for the right? first time. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> like you're, you're going to become one of us now. Let's enjoy watching him do it. Yeah, you know, that's, right, that's right. sort of that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that I mean that for me is one of the more interesting uh, explorations of the vampire. It's it's either one extreme or the other. It's the it's the wantonness of it which I like a lot. You know, the abandon where it's just like pure excess and pleasure and whatnot. I love that. I how, love that. how long do you think you could get away with it? Ah, uh, it's difficult to say, isn't it? Because at some point, your lack of aging is going to get noticed. Right, yeah. You'd have to and move have around, to, wouldn't you? You'd have to keep... Yeah, that's kind of torturous, isn't it? Yeah. If you're the only one. You can't ever stay static. You are immediately a nomad, aren't you? Wherever you go, I reckon, at our sort of age, you could claim you were like perhaps late 20s yeah. and just you know and you get away with it for about 20 years by the time you were meant to be about 40 and then you'd have to move on again so you'd never be able to stay anywhere for more than a couple of decades so really you would never put down anchorage would you not properly no you would actually be like transient which is really interesting again there's a really interesting kind of psychological or even social exploration to be had through the mythology of the vampire I, I like also that. think it'd be a lot you know harder what? now. I, I really like that idea, the notion of, like, the wandering vampire. Well, you'd have to be to get away with it, because also forensics and stuff are that shit hot now. Right, you can't right. just leave a trail of bodies wherever you go. No, right. even Even though the method that you're employing to kill people is weird, you yeah. still technically be a serial killer. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely true. The only other way I can think of of getting away with it is, like, kind of coming clean. It's just saying to people, right, okay, I'm a vampire, I'm immortal, I need to drink blood, but I don't necessarily need to kill people. So just supply me with blood, you know, like from blood bags or something. I'd go and work for CIA or something. Right? Yeah. <laughs> just drop me into the middle of Afghanistan and what, I'll fucking kill all terrorists as long as you don't question how many of them I eat or whatever. <laughs> Well, actually, you know, <laughs> given the influence and the power of the vampire, I would become like an activist. I would actually take down most power structures. Yeah, um, you could do that. In the world. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I'd establish a new order. I definitely would. I always um, wonder about that with demons. Why, why do demons always like... I actually explain this from my perspective in, in my books, but but why do they always possess like a child or something? Right, why not possess right. a guy who's got access to nuclear missiles or something? I've, I've had this discussion on Strange Playgrounds before. I've actually spoken to people about this. Like, I've I wanted, always wanted to write the story, right? You know, just the exorcist, yeah? So you get yeah. someone who comes in to see to talk to the possessed little girl, or, or to the demon, actually. Yeah. And I've always wanted the, the person, like the the exorcist themselves, to sit and say to the demon, like, Okay, cut the crap, cut the stupid theatrics. Because ultimately, in mm. these stories, when a demon possesses a little girl or a little boy or whatever, everything they do is just silly theatrics, isn't it? Yes. It's yeah. never that serious, ultimately. It's never that profound. It's just silly ghost train theatrics. It's the spitting pea soup. It's the swearing. It's the, the head swiveling around. They're just parlor tricks, aren't they? They're silly parlor tricks, ultimately. So I've always wanted the, the exorcist to sit down and just be rational about it and say... Okay, enough with the bullshit, yeah? First of all, what's the point? Yeah. Tell me what the point is. You're obviously an intelligent creature, yeah? You can communicate, you can think. So, what's the point? Uh, well, okay. One, you can say no to this, but one, if you want, I could send you a story where I've kind of written that. Yeah, right, so, yeah. One of the chapters in the second of my... Um, occult detective books is him the entire chapter is him having a conversation with a child who's possessed right the chapter is actually called conversations with a possessed child right okay and he asks him all this sort of thing uh I can send it you if you'd like to read it. I would, yeah, I absolutely. But I, I might just have to preface it with a bit of context about the character that you don't know, because okay. it's kind of like coming into season two of a series you haven't watched. I mean, you know, so there's some. Now that I sit and think about it, you could do the same with almost any horror creature, couldn't you? You so really could. You could why do, why do you faff about with this? Why don't right. you just do that? Oh, you yeah. could sit with Dracula and say, why are you fucking about in a damp, dark, cold castle? For example, yeah. you know, you could, you could just make him ruthlessly efficient, couldn't yeah. you? Yeah, <laughs> you could. Ju you, you are, you are immortal. You're tireless. You could make like a utopian civilization here, and all they need to do is like give you a bit of blood now and then, 
and you'll be fine. So yeah. why are you messing about? You know, <laughs> why are you playing into this this theatrical role of the monster? <laughs> of the evil villain why don't you do something more interesting with it and it, you know it's funny that no one ever asks them that isn't it you know that no one yeah. ever actually says hang on hang on what's the point of this <laughs> yeah i think it, the, the danger with that is that like i think with the, when you're dealing with a character who is as powerful as dracula They've got to be all these rules. Yes. Otherwise, there's no way out. You've written yourself into a corner. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's anti-story in a way. It's sort of anti-storytelling because you need these things to happen to have a story, you know? But it's, it is the kind of thing that can also give birth to story too because it's exactly what Terry Pratchett does in his Discord yes. books. It's, it's basically fantasy characters, fantasy archetypes, including horror archetypes like the vampire and whatnot, coming up against logic and, you know, logical situations ultimately yeah it, it inspires these questions doesn't it which you can then write a story where someone else asks those questions yeah. or or where those questions come up right, they, they right. kind of did that on the end of the modern bbc dracula where yeah. they said you only have these limitations because you think you do but they yeah. really didn't explain why no i mean it's a good way to take it conceptually it's a good idea you know it's a really clever yeah, interesting is, yeah. idea, but they don't do anything with it no, you know, no. It just it's just a it's it's a tagged on thing at the end, and that's oh god, it. you know what's really bad example of that? Uh, there's a film adaptation yet again of the turning of the screw in the cinema yeah. at the moment. Oh, another one. Yeah, Is and that at the end of it, now? yes, right, okay. and it's it's pretty good until. Yeah. Genuinely, the last five minutes mm -hmm. where they decide this is a spoiler for anyone oh, who hasn't yeah. watched it. They decide that it's all in the nanny's head and she's insane. Mm -hmm. Which is fine because yeah. the book kind, kind of, of suggests you never that, know, yeah. you never know. But no, they decide to say on the film, full on, oh. no ambiguous, this is her imagination. But all the way through the film, there is nothing to telegraph that right. at all. Right, so it just comes at out of all. nowhere, basically. It comes out of nowhere with the same kind of slap in the face as yeah. when you're watching a soap opera from the 80s, yeah. and it's like, oh my God, it's his evil twin. Yeah! <laughs> oh, it's, it was it's, all it's one of them. It's yeah. one of them twists where you think, what the hell is yeah. this? This is ridiculous. This is absurd. It's an M. Night Shyamalan twist, isn't it? You know? It is, where there's no setting up there's no telegraphing. Like I, I did a book with quite a big twist, which you reviewed actually for the mm. Ginger Nuts of Horror. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the my other other side of the mirror, the crime yeah, book. Now, there's like a twist at the end of that. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and read it a second time, it makes sense. you it it is telegraphed throughout yeah. the book. There is various scenes where you, when you know that's coming, yeah. you will look and go, "Oh fucking hell! How did I miss that?" How and did you I can possibly, see it. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's integral, isn't it? It's part of the story. It but, really is. But th th this kind of twist, like in the turn of the screw, all this version of Dracula where he yeah. suddenly says, oh, he's only got these limitations because he thinks he has, there's nothing to set that up. No, it's just slapped in there in the final page of the script. Yeah. And it, it's cheap, isn't it? That's ultimately very, it. It's very, cheap. very cheap. Yeah. And kind of condescending as well because it, it expects the audience to swallow it. Yeah? Yeah, it does. It's like, oh, oh okay. You, you couldn't think of anything better to do and we're just supposed to buy into this now. Yeah. I mean, but it, it, the, this is where the arrogance of Moffat's writing comes in for me yeah. because he, he wraps that kind of thing up in such fancy dialogue right. that it's almost as if the characters are saying, if you don't understand this, then it's because you're not clever it's enough. It's because you're thick, basically. And you know what? You are absolutely right. That is something that is... It pervades Moffat's writing. It, it really does. It. If you look at, like, you know, the adaptation of Sherlock, yeah? Yeah. The... I, I really, I, I really find those uh, that series difficult. I find it really difficult yeah. because it does the inverse of what the books do. If you read the original Sherlock Holmes books, what they do is they're fun to read because they give you the reader all of the information. Yeah, they it's layered throughout it. It's all there. If you want to be a, you, so you, it's a game, isn't it? You're playing a game with Sherlock as you're reading. Yes. You're trying to put together the the uh, the the solution to the mystery as he is, and it makes sense. It always makes sense. Yeah. In the TV series of Sherlock, what the TV series, the Moffat adaptation, does, it calls it actively calls the audience stupid. 
Yeah, because then it gets to the end, and it'll be like, oh, I'll explain all of this, using a bunch of shit that you never saw that on camera. That you never bloody saw. <laughs> so you don't, you, you know. And also, half the time... It's like, oh, it's... I noticed his shoes were tied like this. Right. Did the camera ever show you his shoes? No, it didn't. Right, well, that's ridiculous then. It because... is. And also, it reduces Sherlock. Instead of, in the books, Sherlock Holmes, yeah, he's very clever, but he's not some super genius. He's not some, like, no. X-Man mutant with a, a super power but in that tv series that's exactly what sherlock is he's an x-man mutant with a superpower it really is yeah yeah it's, and uh, it's uh, ridiculous however good a detective are you are you're not going to figure out someone's a murderer based on the fact that they've missed a shirt button when they're right. fastened up you know what right. i mean that kind of thing it's like now you're entering the realm of psychic powers now this is you this is ridiculous you are and the kind of the kind of sort of inductive reasoning that he's using there is such bullshit it is because there's so much of it where it's like, oh, I saw you did this, so that must mean that, which must mean exactly. this, which means you want toast for breakfast, which means this. And actually, all it would take is for someone to say, no, actually, I actually that, that's not true at all. No, I missed my bus, so I was in a rush, so I tied my laces right. wrong. You know, that's, that's... Right. It, it narrows reality down to this cartoon, doesn't it? Where yeah. everything has a very simple and clear and certain explanation, and it doesn't. You can't interpret signifiers like that. That's not the way investigations work. It's not no. the way interpretation of art works or anything, you know? It's no. silly as hell. It's the silliest it is, thing. But it's done in such a way and such a pace that it's like the saying that if you don't get it, it's because you're thick. It's yeah, not right. that the writing's bad. No. It's that you're thick if you don't it's get it. It's that you're thick as pig shit, basically, yeah. That's exactly it. it the, the series actively insults its audience all the way through. And it's something Moffat's writing does all the time. He does it a lot when he wrote Doctor Who. I found yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. He does. And don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to, like, really come down on the guy because some of the episodes he's written, certainly when he was under the authority of another head writer, were actually pretty good. Yes. You yeah. He's, he, actually, his Doctor Who episodes when he wasn't the showrunner yeah. are some of the best episodes of the new right. Doctor Who. Completely agreed. Like, Blink, you know, Blink was amazing. Yeah. Was absolutely. And amazing. he did the. the, the um... Oh, what was it? The library one was wasn't that oh, one of it? Yes, uh, Silence in the Library. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which was very good, very good indeed. But when he's in charge, it goes yeah. to hell. And the reason is because the writing is so arrogant. You've always got that frantic last five minutes where everything's explained rapidly, like Sherlock is and like Dracula was, where. Really take your time throughout the episode, but then in the last five minutes, I'm going to do a massive info dump, and if you don't follow it, that's your fault. That's your fault. Um, yeah, that's the yeah. way storytelling works. So that, but it's no, it's it just and it's it's irritating, isn't it? It's irritating. It's the I, fact I didn't that... mind it in Doctor Who because I could understand that this character knows a hell of a lot more than yeah. anyone else because he's Doctor Who and he's like yeah. this god. So fair enough, but. Sherlock, I found it increasingly tedious, yeah. and then they did it on Dracula again, yeah. and it, yeah, yeah. I mean, in Sherlock, what they started to do eventually. I mean, in Sherlock, in the at least in the first two seasons, they do at least take the trouble to explain what he saw and what you know the process by which yes. he eventually got got the information that you were never shown as the audience. There's that. It, towards the end, it's so bloody arrogant that he just starts shrugging his shoulders and saying, oh, I'm Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, but do you know what the difference is? The first few se first two seasons were modernised versions of existing Sherlock That's Holmes it. stories. That's it. Yeah. The later ones were just made up. And they are terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, the difference. My God. You can tell when it goes off script, when they suddenly don't have a thing to adapt yeah. based on, you know. Yeah, right. And it's, it is so irritating because, you know what, those stories stand up really well to yeah, a they do. Not an eye. I mean, they're, they're gorgeous. I, st I started rereading them quite recently, and they're like, they're pure storytelling. Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, like, they, they really kind of hold you. In the sense that there's no wider implications. They're not trying to say anything about anything, really. They're not trying to like say anything about politics or class or anything. They're just pure storytelling. And the I have a, to be a book that... Yeah, there is. I, I have a book that's Sherlock Holmes versus Dracula, but I've not read it yet. <laughs> I've got it, well, but it's in my pile. You know, have you seen? Have you read any of the um, the wider sort of like the fan Sherlock Holmes things out there? Where there's like a sub industry. There's like Lovecraftian Sherlock Holmes stories. Yeah, I've read a few of them. Actually, have you read the? Um, 
the 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 Moriarty one, which is actually classed as official canon now. No. There was a Moriarty one wrote in about nineteen fifty something. Right. And it's if you know like with some of the Bond ones, if the official state reads it and says, Yes, this is now classed as a proper Bond novel sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Even though Arthur Conan Doyle did not Arthur Conan Doyle, yeah. even though Fleming didn't write it, it's uh-huh. now classed as a Bond film, yeah. uh, a Bond book. Well, it, it's the same with Holmes. There are a very small number yeah. which are now classed as officially part of Holmes, even though they weren't written by Conan Doyle. Not many. Anyone can write him because he's public domain, but it right. doesn't usually get classed as official canon. But yeah. there is a couple that are, and there is a Moriarty one which is brilliant, right. which suggests that. It's written from Moriarty's perspective, uh-huh. this one. And it's right. after the Reichenberg Falls. Yeah. And the idea is Moriarty himself. You know when you first meet Moriarty and yeah. he's got like a, a like a couple of bodyguards? Yes, yeah. One of those big muscly goons is Moriarty. Oh, right, I see. So the, he the Moriarty a, you see is like a plant. He's like a, a surrogate, yes. yeah? He was a street thug who learned every... Like Stalin was just a paper pusher who learned every aspect of government business and worked his way up and manipulated everyone and got where he was right. that way. Right, okay. He was a, he was a street-level thug who learned every aspect of the criminal industry mm-hmm got his way to the top and then formed this empire. But he knew nobody would take this big, tough, Vinnie Jones-looking fella seriously. So he hired this thin, gaunt accountant criminal and said, for all intents and purposes, you're Moriarty. I'm always going to be at your side feeding you what to say, but anyone comes to speak to Moriarty, they speak to you. you, Basically, yeah, that makes sense. And that is who went over the Reichenberg Falls. Right. But even Holmes didn't realise that that isn't Moriarty. Oh, I like that. And I thought that was brilliant. But apparently so did the state of Arthur Conan Doyle because they, that is classed as an official continuation right. of the book. Interesting. Yeah, I like that. It's really, like If you that. can find that, it's worth reading it. It's really, really good, that one. But it's interesting how like these things do fit together. I can definitely see like a Sherlock Holmes Dracula Sort of yeah, I, I haven't read the book that I've got, but I can see how it works. It, the kind of you can see them fitting into the same yeah. reality. I like the principle of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah. I like the fact that I mean, I I, I, I will quote controversy and say that I quite enjoyed the film. <laughs> yeah, don't let Alan Moore hear you say that. Oh, you know, Alan Moore hates everything. It's true. It's true. Alan Moore hates everything. The, the Watchmen film's better than the book and all. <laughs> just, just finish that off and all. Look, if you're going to say we need to unite the world against an alien threat, uh-huh. why not use the one existing superpowered being that you've already established in your book rather sense. than just making up a big squid thing? It does, it you've does already make sense. got Dr. Manhattan, so just use that. That yeah. makes so much more sense. It does make sense, and I can see why it was done. You know, I can see why I agree, that was I agree. the choice. Yeah? But so, I do like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen idea, mm. but I just think there was perhaps a poor selection of characters. Some of them don't quite fit into the same world. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, they're from Victorian period, so let's slap them together. So let's just slap you, them together, you, yeah, because like Frankenstein you, you, is, con- is considerably older than like the Jules Verne characters or the, yeah. you know, the dra- you know, he's considerably older than... Um, like, Jekyll, you can have you, know? the, you can have the Invisible Man with Jekyll and Hyde yeah. because both of these are scientists experiencing with different stuff yeah, yeah. on the fringe of science. You can probably also tie Frankenstein into that. Possibly. But then if you bring Dracula in, that's a bit... That's when it starts... It's all the mythology bit. now. Yeah. Because now you're doing science mixed with the supernatural mm. and now it's complicated. So it's like, okay, so does that mean everything's real then? Mm-hmm. Because I always find that as a slightly odd thing in occult stories. Buffy does this as well. So it's like, okay, so vampires are real, fine. But that doesn't have to mean that werewolves are real and aliens are real and ghosts are real and robots are real. And that, yeah. You can't stop with just vampires. Yeah, it's you know, okay you don't... just to have vampires, isn't it? It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I understand why you wouldn't when you're doing 28 episodes per season and you've got, you can't always have vampires. I, I get that. Yeah. But from a mythological point of view, it gets very complicated. Like I always find that, I mean, I, I stopped watching it because I got bored of it, but you know yeah. the series Supernatural? Oh, yeah, I know it very well, yeah. By the end of that, 
everything's real. Every every mythology you've ever heard of, every god you've ever heard of, every you name it, it's there. Actually, so what, I mean, what is the rules to this? Yeah, funnily enough, Sabrina is going the same way. You know the uh, the church yeah, is a bit. Sabrina. It's going exactly Lovecraft the same family. Way. Yeah, but it's got it's got so much in it now. There's there's Lovecraft, there's Greek gods, there's Celtic gods, there's pagan really? gods. There's, just, there are different types of witch, you know. There's different types of like angel and all sorts of stuff. It's 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 going ve- it's getting very complicated. I think once you get to that, that's when it sours a bit. So that, that's what I was going to say with regards to Dracula and the the Sherlock Holmes thing. You could add that in because all it takes is the idea that there is another side to the world that sherlock doesn't know about yeah. so that oh, works yeah. it's fine i mean I, for, I, for example like the lovecraftian sherlock stuff works generally quite well yes because this stuff has remained hidden for so long uh-huh. that the idea that sherlock would have just ignored it yeah right because and he also, thinks it wasn't I mean, real. That, that works lovecraftian stuff is very interesting because it isn't necessarily a cult or metaphysical it's it's a kind of science isn't it you know it's almost like dinosaurs isn't it when we yeah. first dug up dinosaurs and like oh shit exactly. the world used to be full of these giant monsters right, it's basically right. that but bigger and further back yeah, i mean even when it looks like in in lovecraft even when something looks like magic or whatever it's technically not no it's not really no it's just something we don't fully understand exactly exactly yeah. it's like operation on a different sphere of existence so i can see how sherlock holmes could get involved with that there is even is it didn't paul kane write a uh, sherlock holmes hellraiser story? he did he signed me a copy of it he's yeah. brilliant yeah i know uh, paul he's a lovely chap yeah I can he's, imagine he's... it's really good isn't it it is. It's brilliant. It's really, really brilliant. The opening sequence is this guy who's be who's like half starved to death, obsessively trying to figure out the the uh, lament configuration, right. and then it, it turns out that that's Sherlock. Oh, okay, interesting. Because it's like a puzzle. He can't. But you know, the con- potential consequences of it have gone from his mind by that point. Right. He just cannot have a puzzle that he can't, he can't solve. Yeah. You know. Course. So it, it's very it, it, quite clearly Paul vastly understands both the Hellraiser yeah. mythology and, and Sherlock Holmes. So it's it it, yeah. it's a very very good book that one. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. <laughs> he's actually um he is he, he's, he's one of the the friendliest most like supportive like yeah. more more established authors that i've ever met to be honest i suppose he's, he's, he's really but yeah that i was i was pleased with how good that book was because i really yeah. wanted it to be and also and, i mean it's a it, difficult it, thing to do isn't it because you've got two established mythologies here that are colliding together it's a it very is. hard thing to get right and I'm, I'm hoping the Dracula one is the same in that it's respectful of, obviously the, the Dracula one isn't by Paul, but, but the, 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 it's the respectful of both mythologies because you can do it. And I think Dracula's mythology is subtle enough yeah. that it would fit into the world of Sherlock. I mean, that, that is the question now, isn't it? It is the question, can you even do a Dracula adaptation that works? Because it's so, it is so familiar it's so it's so pervasive what do you do with it what approach do you take with it do you go okay let's do a straight telling let's do a straight adaptation of the book setting it in the modern day is difficult because yeah. we don't know the limitations of it like yeah. what if i just sit in with an assault rifle right right and also i mean what with things like like modern weaponry for example exactly just blow him up yeah, how how how, how strong is his regeneration capacity? Right. What if I drop to throw a grenade at him? Yeah. What if I did? You know, there's got to be a limit on it, or, yeah. or if there isn't, we don't know about it. Right, right. Does it have to be a stake to his heart? But what if he's blown to so many pieces that his heart isn't even in his chest anymore? <laughs> yeah, right. What happens then? <laughs> yeah. So modern day throws up too many questions. So I, I do think Dracula adaptations kind of have to be in that Victorian. <laughs> So do you go hyper gothic perhaps do you go for like the real straight dark gothic i think i would because that's what i like and that's what drew me to him in the first place for me it, for dracula that's what you do with it that's yeah. what you do with it i i just like the sumptuous as soon as you oh god have you seen blade 3 i've got to mention I this one i've seen blade 3 I jesus christ what i mean i like it. dominic purcell but what was that what was going on there <laughs> as soon as you met dracula into a dude with jeans right. and a white shirt you think oh god no this that is... was that was a troubled production was that you can tell yeah you yeah. can tell that was a troubled production the lack of guillermo del toro 
was um, apparent. Yeah, and also there's a line in it which really grates on me where um, Dominic Purcell's character, who's Dracula, is talking to Blade and he says, I can't remember the context of the conversation, but he says, haven't you read Stoker's work of fiction? I was the first. Mm. And I thought, right, you clearly haven't read it because he never says that. It never, ever (laughs) says that. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that at all. <laughs> now, um, the only the only thing I liked about that, and they didn't about that scene about that film, and they didn't explore it enough, was the idea of Dracula responding to how he's perceived in the modern world. Right, I like that. There is, yeah. there is a scene where he walks into a shop, and there's like Dracula bobbleheads and yeah. t-shirts and all this, and they didn't really go far enough with it. All they did is he just turned up and yeah. killed the shopkeeper. It's a joke, I, isn't I, it? I, I liked that idea of what would he think to that? Like yeah. just like you said at the top of this, what would Bram Stoker think? Well, wouldn't it be this? great to write what a story? What would Dracula think? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it be great to write a story where he emerges into sort of like the present day, for whatever reason, mm-hmm. and he's he is exploring this. He is ex- actually exploring like what the status quo is and it's it's kind of defanging in a way the fact that there are bobbleheads the fact there are all of these films and whatnot and it's like i i'm not what i was made anymore do you think you'd respond to that by going full-on slaughter just no, to kind i of... think no i think it'd be great more fun and more interesting if he if he receded if he was oh, sort really? of like, okay. he, he almost like retreated and was confused by it more than anything. I think that would be really interesting to play with. Yeah, it would actually. I quite like the idea of different vampires responding to things in different ways. I like that on Thirty Days of Night. Yeah. Where yeah, the young where the vampires vampire, are like, let's I mean, go to this town and slaughter everyone, and yeah. then the old vampires turn up and like, what the fuck are you doing? And the vampires Do themselves that... are like very different, you know. The great, but do you remember that scene at the end with the older ones where they're annoyed at them because yeah. they're like, "We have survived by remaining hidden, yeah, and subtly killing a few people here and there, mm. and you've just turned up and slaughtered a full town, right, in full view of cameras and CCTV, and people could phone up and say, "Oh my God, we're getting attacked by vampires, right. and you've just done this." You've just and the fact it. that. Yeah, the fact that it's almost like the Dracula version versus the Lost Boys version, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I quite like the idea, because, I mean, the notion of there being different types of vampire is kind of cool. I mean, you get that yes, in too, is. obviously. You know, you get the Reapers, or the Reavers, are they called? The, the vampires. It's like, isn't that vampires. like a mutation of the disease yes, or something? Yeah. Like, oh, God. What's the mythology on Blade, though? Jesus, yeah. this confuses me. Because the first film is like... Oh, it's a disease of the blood that gives you superhuman powers and it means you're vulnerable to UV radiation, hence sunlight, but also there's a chemical element in silver and a chemical element in garlic that can be extracted and hurt you, but it's basically a disease. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, he is a blood god. Yeah. At the end of the film, here's the right. god of vampires, and you're like, wait, whoa, 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 hang so, on, I thought yeah. you said this was a disease, who's so, this? what's going on again? What's going on yeah. again? I mean, you get a, you, I mean, a, another version is the strain, of course, where you have yes. a, it's a, it's a parasite. It's a, it's a worm-like parasite that does have certain metaphysical qualities, it seems. I like... See, I, I, I kind of I'm a stickler for the rules with shit like that. Either it's a disease or it's supernatural. Yeah. You can't have both. You can't have both. It's one or the other, yeah. Yeah, you can't say it's a disease, but then have the rule about not being able to come in without being invited. You, yeah, you, you yeah. can't have. You can't say it's a disease and then have the cross hurt. Right, them. right. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly. Yeah, it's it's one or the other, isn't it? Yeah, because if it's a disease, you can have that completely in the absence of God yeah. or the devil or anything like that. Uh-huh. You don't need the spiritual size of it. It's just, imagine if AIDS also made you superhumanly strong, right. but, you had, to, but right. you had to kill other people to survive yourself. That's, yeah. you know... It's an extremely viral and blood disease, but imagine that there was some upside to it. Well, that's, I mean, that's another aspect of vampire mythology that's really underexplored, which is, of course, like diseases of the blood. You get yeah. it in um, Lost Souls. There is a vampire in Lost Souls that has AIDS, for example. Oh, how does that work then? It's really interesting because it mutates into something slightly different in the vampire. Um, okay. It doesn't kill him, it causes him tremendous pain. 
Yes. Like, tremendous pain. <laughs> and he has to be very careful about, like, how he interacts with things and how he, what, who he drinks and whatnot. Um, but that's kind of interesting. That is kind of interesting. There is a story in one of the old DC comics that we mentioned earlier about this guy who's got uh, cancer. He's, like, forming mm. tumours all in his body. And he sells his soul to a demon to be immortal. Oh, so he's eternal cancer, yeah? But it doesn't cure the cancer. So he's, he's eternally in pain. and So by the end of it, he's this like giant blob-like yeah. creature because his body is just constantly growing tumours. So he's like Elephant Man mm-hmm. times a thousand. It's just the most awful thing. Ever. Interesting. <laughs> but it's a scary idea. That, it is, shit, isn't it? I mean, it, it's something you're immortal, they did, but you, you know. Bizarrely and funnily enough, that's something they introduced to the Venom character in Spider-Man. Yes. Um, he's um, Eddie Brock. You know, the, Eddie the had cancer at one point, didn't he? That's and the, right. the symbiote was kind of constantly keeping it in a state of not remission, but kind of holding the line, holding wasn't it? In it? Place, basically, yeah. So he's, yeah. he's kind of condemned to eternal cancer because of this, this creature, you know? Um, yeah. It's lymphatic cancer he has, and it's, it's attacking his adrenal nodes, and the symbiote feeds off of adrenaline. That's it. So yeah, I remember that one. It's sort of sustaining. I don't even know if it's still part of the law, to be honest. But in that particular, at that time, <laughs> that's what it was, basically. You know, it's an interesting way of taking it. I kind of, I kind of like it. It introduces a degree of yeah. It makes you think. If you have got an illness of some kind, when you become a vampire, do you keep that illness? Like, right. do you still need glasses? Right, right. Do you have the infirmities? That you do you still have? If you were crippled, are you now able to walk? Right. Or... Yeah. Interesting. Or are there are there vampiric diseases? Are there you know diseases that would afflict you as a vampire that wouldn't afflict a human being? Yeah, possibly. That, because your entire physiology is different, isn't it? Right. So that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. I like that idea. The notion of vampiric diseases is very interesting. Some sort of like um, parasite, for example, that you get from sleeping in the dirt or in the coffin or whatever. Yeah, well, there's all sorts of Ill- there's all sorts of like insects that only affect a particular animal. Right, right. So what so, if there's something the, the, that's evolved know. alongside vampires? Yeah, you know, va- like parasitically or infectiously or whatever. That's kind of fun, isn't it? I like. Yeah, that idea. it's like there's a whole ecosystem evolved as a well, result yeah, of this. Well, why you know, wouldn't there be? You know, I mean, if if vampires exist, why wouldn't there be a whole? E- there's a whole ecosystem around humans. So why would there not be one for vampires too? Well, yeah, because humans are only really alive because there's that many organisms on and in our and bodies. Is. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. the, the way I I like to think of it is that every every heartbeat is a little genocide, isn't it? You know, there's so many like microorganisms that are killed and that die and then regenerate with every breath that we take. Yeah. Um, it's, it's. I love that episode of Futurama where fries got worms, but they actually. <laughs> In the future, worms are actually really beneficial because right, right, they, they clean your body out, and, the, and yeah. they they want the body to be optimum condition for them oh, to live in. What so... a science fiction concept! The notion of a disease like a that's symbiotic. Yeah, that basically... but then Fry gets rid of it because he's worried that it's not him anymore, is oh, it? Doesn't right. he? Ah, uh, yeah, which is the one of your classic cop outs as for, yeah. for not having anything changed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but it's an interesting idea that, like, you, you know, a vampire would have something similar. Yeah, it would have a disease. Evolved to, to, you know. Yeah. I, I just like the notion of immortal diseases, you know, diseases that afflict immortals or whatever. I think that's really cool. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, can you imagine if you 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 were a wheelchair user and you or something and you got made a vampire thinking that that would fix it and it didn't? And it doesn't. Mm, so you have something that's yeah that would be interesting you you would have to rely on servants to bring you your prey as well right yeah there's there's a lot of stuff going on there isn't there there's a lot of um like issues and themes that you could explore with that. They kind of do with something similar with the psychic vampires in the uh the doctor sleep Oh the... yeah, the, uh, the who are slightly odd vampires, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah, because they don't drain blood or anything, no. but they are essentially vampires. The low men, know. is it the low men? I don't know what they're called. Yeah, I think they, they are. Like the low drain men. the psychic energy out of people, don't yeah, they? But, yeah, they're, they're... But there's there's one in that who the idea is you do get old, yeah. but it's 
slowed down. Uh-huh. But the, the, and now this is something I wonder if anyone said with vampires is that so like you know like with drugs, the more you take, the more you need to get the same effect. Right. They kind of say that in Doctor Sleep, in that the older, you, the longer you live, the more of this shine that you need yeah. to take to maintain your immortality. Okay. It becomes like a bigger and bigger debt, if you yeah. like. So you need to take more and more. Is that ever suggested to be the same with vampires? So like, oh, when, you, when you first start your first year of a vampire, you can get by on one victim a month. Yeah. But by the time you're a century old, you've got to have five a day. Yeah, is it? now that's interesting, isn't it? That is interesting. It's when you, I mean, a lot of a lot of mythologies have taken it further as well, haven't they? So you have evolutions of the vampire. So you have like soul vampires, for example. Um, the Legacy of Cain video games yes. go to that, yes. where you have Raziel, of course, um, who's a, a very different type of vampire, or at least he is after Cain has, has chucked him into the abyss. Yes. Um, he consumes souls as opposed to blood. Yeah, Kane is more traditional as a vampire, isn't he? Yeah, he, he drinks blood basically. He's a he's a proper vampire, um, but a very, again, a very different take on the mythology because they're technically alien vampires because they're from another world. They're from Nosgoth, you know, and vampires are a very, 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 very different entity there than they are in almost any other mythology. Um, they're, they're aliens in Vampirella. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, the notion of the the alien vampire has been around for a long time. I mean, hey, technically, the aliens in War of the Worlds are vampires. Yeah, true. They, they, drain, drain, they drain the blood, they yeah. They drain blood, and they, um, they, they inject it into their own veins in the original novel. That's part of why they're here. You know, they're sort of harvesting humanity. Um, and that's part of what defeats them, because they, they, they take disease into themselves. And I liked the suggestion on... I don't know if it was the most recent BBC adaptation of War of the Worlds, but I like the suggestion that the Martians aren't necessarily an amazingly advanced race. They're just more advanced than we are. Yeah. But right. that doesn't mean they're like indestructible gods. No, it's, no. it's just that if basically if those Martians with that technology invaded now, mm. we'd kick the shit out of yeah, them. Yeah, right. It's just because them tripods and get blood to shit with the weapons we've got now. It's just that they happen to invade in Victorian. They happen to invade in Victorian times, where the best thing we've got is a cannon. A steam boat. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Whereas now we'd kick their ass if they invaded now. But the idea that they are just a desperate race who is just slightly more advanced than us. It's the equivalent of us invading Africa in Victorian Uh, times. Well, I mean, that is definitely an implication of the original book. Yeah, of course it it is. Definitely is. It's about imperialism, you know. It's a book of yeah. imperialism. Um, and it, but that just reminded me with, with you saying about them being vampires. I feel that, yeah, that, that, the, the idea that they are kind of desperate. Because mm-hmm. vampires always have a bit of desperation to oh, them, don't they? Well. It's kind of what makes them interesting, isn't it, to a certain degree? The fact that they, they have that limitation, they have that hunger, you know? They have to feed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the price of this. And I quite like the idea that the price gets higher the longer you become one. Mm. I like that too. I think that's really interesting. So the older vampires need to feed more. Yeah, well, because like every year you add on to your life, you're gonna have a more your natural life. The cost of it is gonna be. I mean, it is anyway. If you yeah. think about, by the time you're ninety five, the amount of drugs and shit. That yeah, you're yeah, to right. Keep, to just keep yourself not dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the vampire equivalent of that. Right. That debt's gonna build up exponentially it, isn't it? it certainly is it certainly is. so like the most ancient ones must have like just com- constant cues of sacrifices <laughs> yeah well i would think that the younger ones would kill them off yeah because you're probably right. they're just gonna be like constantly dri- i mean imagine if you live somewhere quite small and you've got a vampire and he's to eat five people a week right how can you possibly get away with your yeah. one a month when he's leaving that trail of bodies you right. kill him Right. You'd do him in because it'd be in your interest yeah, to do it. It would. It would. You're absolutely correct. But yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of potential stories, aren't there? There's still a lot of potential stories. There is, once about... you think about it. Yeah, I really start... like to let Ask the right questions. one in as well. Oh, that's one of my favourites. Yeah. Let, let the right one in was one of my absolute favourite vampire stories of recent years. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. The yes, notion... I did as well. The, the 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 a that the vampire there is so interesting 
the fact that the guy looking after her was her friend when he was a little boy and he's been doing it that long all of that is just beautiful like, the whole notion of like the, su- the, the the seduction of the vampire but it's brought down to a childhood level yeah where it's it's so interesting i thought it was very clever very clever that to me shows that there is still kind of life in the vampire genre oh, yeah. if you're creative enough with it oh totally it, it, you know what it reminded me of more than anything ginger snaps it yes. was like ginger yes. snaps for the werewolf you know yeah it's, as long as you you don't tread the old ground and you do something fun and intuitive and interesting you can you can still do something that's so it's fascinating and it takes the material to another level yeah absolutely it's, it's just you've got to look at it from a different angle and i think having the child vampire and, and again her so almost like as a victim really yeah. she she wasn't her fault that this had happened no, to her but... no it was um it's a powerfully beautifully ambiguous film isn't it yes like the morality because... of it is complex because like oh she, people have got to die for her to eat mm. yeah but is that her fault she's higher up on the food chain right. now i mean people die someone died for me to eat today right. i had chicken for my tea right, so something, right. you know it's like well is it, is it her if you if you get turn into a vampire tomorrow mm-hmm. and you're now higher up on the food chain right what's the difference in morality between you eating humans and me eating cows and chickens and it's, stuff it's a really powerful argument isn't it it's, it's very it's, hard especially to argue against. if you take the if you take the religion out of it because if you're a christian you have this notion that humans are special yeah. that we're god's special people yes. so so killing one of us is somehow the worst thing that you can possibly do but if you come at vampire from an atheist perspective mm-hmm. as in humans are just another animal just an that animal, happens, yeah. happens to be more evolved right. then a vampire killing a human is no more immoral <laughs> than a human killing a chicken really you're, you're kind of right yeah it's it's there's a it's a powerful in its own peculiar way you can use the vampire to provide a very powerful argument for vegetarianism and indeed yes, veganism, you probably right? could yeah you really yeah. can um and that i don't think i've ever seen that done in a, a vampire story before certainly not as the main focus no. I'm, I'm not aware of it no no but it would be interesting to have a go but like what's it? the alternative like, like oh so through no fault of your own like with the girl in let the right one in mm-hmm. this has happened to you this yeah. is your state now what are you supposed to do then just sit down and, and start die, right yeah absolutely that's not your fault you haven't done no. this to yourself you're no. not a serial killer by choice this it's is just absolutely true and it's very powerfully uncomfortable isn't it it is, yeah. Whereas you get the feeling with Dracula that he'd do it anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> he, he, he drinks when he's not even hungry, doesn't yeah, he? Because he's he a just... monster, isn't he? Because yeah. he's a bastard, basically, at heart. Yeah. You know? well, and he's, he's absolutely tempest. aware of the fact that he's above humans. But, right. going back to the aristocracy thing, he probably felt like that when he were a human. I was going to say, he's Vlad Tepes, isn't he? Yeah. So he probably did, yeah. And he did lots of things when he was human that were just as bad, you know? Yes, he did, yeah. So... Um, but yes, uh, I think, unless there's anything else you f- you want to talk about, Lex, I think we can draw it to a close. I think, yeah, see. I think we've, we've covered a lot I of ground. I think we've gone over there. a lot of a lot of earth there, a lot of uh, a lot of turned Transylvanian soil. Yes. I think we've walked there. Um, before we go, is there anything, of course, that you'd like to pimp out? Uh, just so, so my look after children's book my the old one on the sea is my most recent release uh, at some point this year i am going to have my ghost novel which we mentioned earlier and also uh, my first collection of short stories but uh, i believe at some point we're going to do a podcast about ghosts aren't we, we are. so I'll, probably, yeah, I'll mention i'll me. mention them at that point yeah <laughs> wouldn't surprise me but links to all of lex's uh, already published work down below by the way guys Go check that out, yeah? Um, but as for me, ladies and gents, you can find me at the usual place. You can find me here at Exaggerated Elegy. Um, you can find my published work on Amazon and at strangeplaygrounds.com. Uh, the second volume of Born in Blood will be out reasonably soon, so that's all cool. And if you want to chat, you can find me over at Enigmatic Elegy on Twitter. Um, once again, Lex, thanks so much. Thanks so much for coming on. It's been a blast. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Always, it's always a pleasure. 
pleasure. Um, and I'm sure, ladies and gents, you'll be hearing from Lex and myself again very, very soon. Until then, bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Ha 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 